Do you guys want to talk about Secret Hitler? No. Nope. Why? <sighs> we've we've gotten into it before, but I felt like that game. We recently played a game of Secret Hitler. I was very excited. I bought. I ordered a box of Secret Hitler because I wanted to play it with my nearest and dearest. Let me tell you, we weren't so fucking dear by the end of two hours of Secret Hitler. That was... That was vicious. And Neve, I know you don't think it was because you have weird emotional problems. <laughs> but things got weird. I don't think it did at all. I was like, this is fun and normal. <laughs> I always knew Neve was a nasty person. Um, I just... I never really knew. No, you don't. You never do until lies are encouraged. But I, I, it was so scary playing with Neve because I feel like with Neve, I feel like I could be a fascist and Neve should be a fascist. If that sentence was alarming to you, please go look up the rules of Secret Hitler. Um, <laughs> and I would still worry about Neve fucking me over, you know? Like she's too much of a wild card like that. I played the game fair. Me and Michelle at the start knew what we needed to do and we did it we just execute a plan well i just remember coming to the end of that and like you know when you can't get out of the game and you're still doubting everybody i had that so did you have that at all brian i did um for me it was just the fact that we'd play a couple games in a row and you'd forget which game you were in mm -hmm. apparently another way to play secret hitler is that you all move spaces each turn Mm. So that way the game feels fresh again. That's a really good idea because you do like assign identities to people. Yeah. Like we had the nasty couch. We had the, the nice floor. We had... You were on the floor. Yeah, I was nice. <laughs> I was also nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think what Guess happens Guess who was on the couch? Two guys go into a game being like, I can read people. I am so good at reading people. And then they can't read people. And then they're like, oh no, my worldview, it's shattered. Because <laughs> I think that's what happened. I'm going to read you so hard next time. I'm going to read you like the fucking I book you are. I think after your first game of Secret Hitler, you know pretty much how much you can read someone or not. Like, that is true. I, I think, I think that, that fantasy did not last one round into the first game I played of that game. I felt it was the same as playing Monopoly. I'm sure you didn't, Eve, but... You like I'm gonna restate what I said earlier in the conversation. You have weird emotional problems. It is true. She's a stone cold fucking killer. An absolute fucking killer. Every day, me and Brian are just so terrified that she's gonna reach out and snuff out our lives. <laughs> we are surrounded by cables right now. She could easily choke a bitch out and then fucking <laughs> and then make the other one look at it, like look at the body and go, "You did that." Oh, welcome to the Let's Fight a Boss video game podcast. The world's... What is it? Strongest. Strongest video game podcast. I am sitting here with two of the greatest spies World War II has ever seen. 119 years old, to my left... It is the slippery one, the man made of oil, the slick. It's <laughs> <laughs> oh, I got myself. It's Brian. <laughs> They'll never catch me. And to my right, a clear heart, a non-existent soul. It's the echo, Neve. Hello. With Hello. you always, I'm your host, Doctor Ted. <laughs> <laughs> oh man so I don't want to get all formal I don't want to like start things off on a serious note but we have some we have some motherfucking business to sort out here we do mm -hmm. so everyone loves when we play the end track at the end of the podcast boy do we what's it gonna be who knows the answer forever nothing <laughs> we've run into some we'll say YouTube issues with our i guess liberal use of licensed music and we were thinking what is the best way to sort this out and being kind of stupid we spent four months thinking about the problem to no solution whatsoever 
And so we've decided to put the call out. Let's Fight a Boss wants an ending track. We want a song that's about 50 seconds to a minute and a half. Kind of like, think, ending theme song or something. Yeah. And we want to source it from the Let's Fight a Boss audience. But before you go and write us an amazing theme song, as I'm sure 80% of you were just about to do, we don't want someone to write a song and then send it to us because we kind of have specific things we'd want from it and we don't want someone to spend a lot of time on it. And I know a lot of people would be willing to because people do crazy things for this podcast. Um, so all someone has to do to apply is just send in an email uh, with a link to your SoundCloud or whatever else and we'll give it a listen and we will pick one person to do it. This absolutely 100% is a paid thing. So please, anyone, do not go and do the song yourself. Just apply to us with like whatever portfolio you have, and we'll give it a listen. And if we think it's gonna work, and if we think your style is gonna work, we will absolutely use that. Just to say again, hundred percent paid thing, and we're super excited about what we're gonna hear because the general fan like level of ability of this podcast is kind of crazy. Do you ever see someone super really talented in their fan base and be like? Why the fuck are they listening yeah, to all us? all the time. Literally all the time. It, 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 it just kind of like puts things in perspective that they're doing like an amazing drawing, but maybe they were listening to us while they drew it. I like Why? It. I like it when people draw us better looking than we ever, ever could oh, be. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank that's, you so much. That's pretty sweet. It's a real ego bump. We yeah. love it. Um, I, think, I think we all have kind of certain vibes of what we'd like the end theme to sound like. Mm-hmm. For me, it was something off the Matrix Reloaded soundtrack. <laughs> <laughs> which is music from and inspired by the Matrix Reloaded. What's what's the song? It's like Mona Lisa Time Bomb or something. <laughs> and then another one was music you would hear at a car park street fight at 3 a.m. Yeah. I think we were saying as well something that sounded like the like you had died in a video game. <laughs> so the like the you've died screen, but then there's a drop. Hmm. Yeah. Because we always kind of fade in the music and then it like kicks. But um, yeah, send us in your stuff. We'd love to give it a listen. And even just, I'd like to hear our audience's music. Same way I'd like to hear our, see our audience's drawings and stuff. Yeah, yeah. But, um, and we're super pumped about what comes in. So, yeah. Guys, it's everyone's favorite section. It's Wrestle Talk. That's ask let's fight a boss at <laughs> gmail.com. Ask let's fight a boss at gmail.com. Super appreciate it, guys. Um, guys, I watched the Royal Rumble. What's who that? body slammed who? Uh, Becky Lynch body slammed the rest of the women's wrestlers. Okay, good. Very yeah. good. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people were really super surprised at how good this um, pay-per-view was. There was like one or two matches I didn't care about, but overall I thought they did a really good job, especially in everything they did with Becky Lynch. Becky Lynch, pretty much hottest wrestler in WWE right now. First match against my girl, Asuka. And I was really scared of this match because I didn't want them to feed Asuka to Becky Lynch. And I was really worried that would happen. Not only did Asuka win, she makes Becky tap out and she looks like a fucking monster doing it. And I was so happy because a loss doesn't hurt Becky, but it does raise Asuka up. And that was fantastic. But then the Women's Royal Rumble happens later And at number 29, an injured woman comes out. Becky comes out being like, fucking let me in that match. And they decide, okay, fuck it. And they let her in. She wins the whole Rumble. It is now Becky Lynch versus Ronda Rousey at um, WrestleMania, which I'm so fucking excited for. They're going to throw Charlotte Flair in there, which I'm not delighted about because I just love one-on-one matches. But Charlotte Flair is also amazing as well. Have you ever seen Charlotte Flair, Neve? Yeah. Blonde? Blonde and tall and muscular. She looks cool. She's Who do cool. you think is going to win that? Do you think they'll let Ronda win? I don't want Ronda to win. I want Becky to win. That's really tough. I think maybe Becky, but I'd say Be- I don't think I don't I don't think Ronda Rousey's winning. But I don't think she's going to lose either. It's one of the other ones that's going to get pins unless it was elimination style. Oh, now we're talking. But I think maybe Becky because now is the time to cash in on Becky and give her a Wrestlemania win but um, overall really good Seth Rollins won the Men's Royal Rumble and ah, I'm not a big Seth Rollins guy I feel like he's just been pushed too much 
But anyway, I can see I have already allotted my wrestle talk time. Thank you, everyone, for putting up with it once again. Brian, why yes. don't you tell us about this fucking thing? Three identical strangers. That's it. Do you know about this documentary? No. Niamh? You were telling me about this. Wait, it's a documentary? I thought it was a movie. No, it's a documentary. That's... Okay. Well, it's a movie documentary. <clears throat> Three Identical Strangers came out last year, and it is a documentary about three men who find out that they're triplets when they're 19 years old wow um they're all raised in different parts of the state of new york surrounding area and at the age of 19 one of them goes to college and gets recognized for his brother and he says i'm not this person you say i am and they're like well are, are you adopted and he was like yeah and he was like this guy was adopted too and then they get each other on the phone they meet up and their name gets out in the paper. And then a third person reaches out and goes, Hey, I, I, I kind of look like you guys too. Imagine getting the phone call of, I look like you guys too as yeah. well. And so it's just this really interesting, amazing story. And it shifts between kind of being like the kind of cute story it is at the start to the difficult story it becomes uh my mom is a twin and i remember one time asking her what's it like to be a twin and she said i can't answer that because i've always been a twin my mom's a twin too and said the same thing yeah and so with this they were themselves until the age of 19 so they had their own childhoods without brothers each one of these guys had an older sister and they were from different financially stable families. Like one was from working class family, middle class family, and then a, a, a rich family. Um, and it kind of goes into their experiences of suddenly at the age of 19, when you're an adult, you find out that you're one third of something instead of being yourself. And they each have their own responses to it. And at the time, a lot of people were so focused on their similarities that they that they kind of forgot about the differences. And it gets quite upsetting. Really? Yeah. Um, but it's a really, really, really interesting documentary. Upsetting think, in like what way? I, I don't want to say. But like there are, there are some tough parts to this delightful documentary. Um, like stuff I was like, no fucking way. Uh, I highly, highly recommend Brian, it. Brian, is there a fourth one? No, no, no. <laughs> that would be I, I I don't think that would be fair in any one if there was a fourth one, um, but they have them all being interviewed or pretty 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 much most of the people who are still around are being interviewed. Uh, they have all the parents because they're all still alive because this all happened in the eighties. Oh, weird. Yeah, and so they're all about in their late fifties, early sixties now, and they're all just New Yorkers. Like, there's just a bunch of New Yorkers talking. Like, it's they're all real characters. That sounds really fun. It's nuts that if he didn't go to that college that day and he wasn't spotted by someone who knew the other brother that that mightn't have ever happened. Yeah. Um, such a freak encounter. And like, they, they all really, really looked alike when they were 19. When they're older, they don't really look alike. Like, they, they, they look like brothers, but they don't look like mirror images of each other anymore. Mm. Um, but it's just like seeing the photo of all three of them together is just insane. Because it, it's just like, like you, 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 you uh, cannot tell them apart at all. That's super weird. Uh, yeah, we we used to have a friend who was a twin, and she'd always talk about how kind of strange it was. Yeah, and like how how it was very difficult to be like on a different consonants to your twin and all this kind of stuff, which sounded crazy. Yeah, um, but they all have a really really good relationship with each other as well. Like they they all connected with each other on the spot. But I think it was kind of like people outside of them had a version of them that they didn't want yeah uh which i which which is a really kind of interesting way uh, route to explore with Weird, the documentary it's really good uh but if this is interesting to you do please watch it you'll know what i mean three um, identical strangers yeah that sounds really good well i saw a film with one identical stranger and that was dragon ball super broly the one identical stranger was Broly. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
this film's been getting a lot of buzz. Like, there, a lot of people have a lot of really good things to say about it. And I think it hit number three at the American box office. Sweet. Which is, like, unheard of. For... Especially especially this time of year. Yeah, yeah, crazy. Um, <clears throat> This is a really good movie. Have either of you seen the original Broly movies? Uh, I've watched YouTube catch-ups on them. Right. That's about it. So Broly is a very strong, angry Saiyan. And he is very angry because Goku cried a lot when they were babies and they were in the same nursery. So he wants to eradicate all life. That's the only reason? That is the only reason. That's great. Yep. I love that. Baby crying is annoying. Yep. He's not wrong. He's not fucking wrong. (laughs) That's a good angle. But, um... And so they had... (laughs) They got three movies out of that. Uh, Broly, Broly comes back, and Broly is made of slime. And he's and he and he explodes at the end of each one of these. I'm pretty sure he is canonically killed, like absolutely no coming back in each movie. But they keep getting his DNA or some shit like that. Yeah, and so now there is a new movie about Broly's back again, and but this time it's like a kind of reboot, and these new films are meant to be canon as well. Mm. So it's like. Broly actually exists canonically in the storyline of Dragon Ball Z and I fucking loved it it was a really really good movie the structure of it's pretty weird it's like basically first 20 minutes all lore shit about Frieza about the Saiyans about all this kind of stuff you see like toddler Vegeta and Raditz and it's fucking brilliant (laughs) that sounds cute it's so cute because like Vegeta is like he's just like this little guy he's in these stupid little shorts and he's like sitting there like eating like some fucking insect person he just killed and they're like Vegeta your your planet's blown up and your father and stuff is dead and he's like eh, that's weird <laughs> <laughs> and it's just that and um, then they show like not toddler Frieza but like very young Frieza and he's such a little shit like even more like this is this is King Cole coming to Prince coming to Planet Vegeta. There's three Vegetas, the planet, the king, and the prince, and him telling King Vegeta, Vegeta's father, that this child is going to be in charge of his planet. And it's really like well done and good. And it's like you know that kind of camp Frieza has? That is like at maximum, and I really, really enjoyed that part of the movie. Then we get another segment where it's kind of like, you know, the earthlings and all them fucking around, and you get some really, really fun, like, Vegeta, Bulma stuff. Vegeta Vegeta loves Bulma. He does. Yeah. It's a really sweet relationship, and I like them a lot. Vegeta and Bulma is way better than um, Goku and... Chi-Chi. Chi-Chi. He's well, bad to her. Yeah, and they never, they never consummated that relationship. Yeah, he's never kissed. <laughs> yeah. Goku sucks. Yeah. Yeah, he's 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 not a good anything. He's he's a terrible dad. He's pretty good at fighting. Yeah. Which let me tell you, it's all you need. Well, I guess Piccolo's around, so that's something. Thank God. What's that face, Neve? I know as long as Piccolo's around to raise your child. You can yeah. fight all you want. Yeah, I guess so. Am I your Piccolo? Like would you raise my child when I go off? Yeah, can I raise your kid? <laughs> I mean, first of all, I'd be like, maybe you'd fuck it up. But then I kind of thought about me, and I was like, <laughs> and not me, the most patient, fucking responsible person, you know. Yeah, but like, I'm, I don't know, we want a cool lesbian aunt, or like, not a cool lesbian aunt. I, I'm a lesbian, you don't know that. <laughs> yeah. I'm a woman. <laughs> it's just how I look. And if it's 2019, gendered means nothing anymore. Yeah. God. Fuck. Back I think the between movie. the pair of you, you could raise a child of mine. Okay. All right, mom. <laughs> okay, dad. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be all right with that. I'd be like, yeah, you know what? Yeah. <laughs> Deal. But, um, so anyway, then Broly shows up, and they have turned Broly, this fucking, just, like, just just a walking power level, a walking big strong. That's what Broly, that's what Broly is. It's a big strong boy. He's a big strong boy. And I swear to God, in a few scenes, they turn him into this ultra just sympathetic likable character Aww. he made friends with a big space dog and all he wants to do <gasps> is play with the space dog 
That is such an instant way to make a character likable is give them a space dog. Because at first, like, he's just really simple. He's really like, oh, what do I do? <laughs> and someone tries to take his cloak away and the cloak is like the ear of his giant space dog. And he's like, no. And it's really, like, nice and sad because his evil dad cut off the space dog's ear because he didn't want Broly playing with it because playing wasn't training. (gasps) Poor Broly. It's really sad. But then we also get these two other characters called Lemo and Chilai. I fucking love these guys. These are two of, like, in terms of adding new characters, the Dragon Ball films are doing a pretty great job because we have Whis and uh, Beerus. Beerus. Beerus, And then we have these guys. And they're really really fun uh, Lemo, Lemo is like this little orange alien in a beanie hat and he's kind of like oh I'm wanted all over the galaxy so I gotta stick with the freezer force and then Chilai is this like little green alien girl who's like super fucking cute and the pair of them like become Broly's like weird adopted family and I swear to god I would watch a spin-off series about these three just traveling through space I would be so much more excited to watch that than watch any more Dragon Ball Super um shit goes bad Frieza gets in there and all of a sudden Broly is on earth kicking the shit out of everything and what's really cool about this film is has like has a really fun like really like nice like bouncy art style all the characters have like you know really kind of like kind of rounded features compared to like the kind of you know the kind of stick figure look of super Mm. that's gone and everyone just looks like kind of the idealized version they look like how you remember them looking in z not necessarily how they looked in z they're so like they're chunky but they're not stiff yeah they're so loose okay and like the detail on the characters is quite low it doesn't matter because they move beautifully and like it's not even in just the fight scenes there's a there's some really great bits of like comedic animation as well like there's there's like a 30 second dialogue segment of Vegeta talking about how much he doesn't want to learn the fusion dance and it's just really funny because like they've really animated all his little gestures and he's very upset um the fight maybe went on a little long for me and I feel like if it went on a little long for me, it's probably going to be too long for a lot of people. But it is really well animated and like it's it's got such a lavish production that like it's the first time I felt like nearly kind of like in a Dragon Ball fight. Because it, it the sense of like motion and like the impact of the punches, it's all so well done that just like you know what Dragon Ball Ball fight fights uh, fights are conceptually, but this is the first time I've ever like really really like felt one and it's fucking brilliant and like there's one bit they fight so hard they fall into an alternate reality that's cool <laughs> it's really cool um really really rec- like i i i thought the beerus movie was okay i really liked return of f but this is hands down i think my favorite of the new movies and i right up there with some of my favorite dragon ball movies better than the vast vast majority with them because most dragon ball movies like they're all right there's one or two really good ones but this one was it was a fucking whale of a time really enjoyed it and brian you were telling me this thing got fucking leaked to youtube yeah i I, well keeps getting pulled down but i've seen like clips of the fight you're talking about and how like i've seen way too many gifs of it for it to for like hd gifs and like like the fight's amazing because they're like moving the camera like throughout the fight. Oh, they do wild shit yeah, with like, the camera. Like it, it feels like when you're playing Fighter Z, but it's just you're you're seeing Dragon Ball the way they've always wanted it to be. Exactly. Yeah. Um someone uploaded the whole film at 1080p just with, the, with the English dub. Some to disgruntled YouTube, Funimation employee. And it keeps getting deleted and re-uploaded. It's there. Um but it's still in the cinema as well. I don't know, I I I, I think everyone who wants to support it support supports it. And people, and people should, are because pe- yeah. people have, I guess. Yeah, and, and people are sharing it too, and it's getting it's, it's getting attention. Yeah. And um, if I'm not mistaken, that's actually only one of two <coughs> Dragon Ball releases uh, this this season, guys. Why don't you tell us about uh, Velvet Buzz Buzzsaw: Return of Frieza? Frieza now works as a museum curator in LA. Go on. I would watch that. <laughs> okay, he would fit in. Tell us about Velvet Buzzsaw, Buzzsaw the Netflix original. Uh, I don't know if it's I original know, or if they Netflix. bought it because yeah. it was bad. They they bought it from some <laughs> festival. They said yeah. we want the rights. To... Oh, actually, before before we talk about Velvet Buzzsaw, did you see that they bought the rights to that the Zac Bundy, Efron, yeah, movie. the Zac Efron Ted Bundy movie, uh-huh. purely because Netflix Ted Bundy. When you Google it, they want all those results pushed 
to the top. I guess so, yeah. Um, and they were like in a bidding war to get that fucking film because it was Jesus. just shown in Sundance. I wonder if it's good. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. People will watch it. It just means if you ter- type Ted Bundy into Netflix, more results are there. Mm-hmm. Sure. Ted Bundy, that hot property. Jesus. Okay, uh, fucking Velvet Buzzsaw. <laughs> See, I'm, I'm getting some real good vibes about this movie. Uh, Neve, Neve and I were both looking forward to this film. Uh, we watched it, and then in our group chat, Neve was like, he was kind of testing the water. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I didn't want to be like, oh, I hate this because the worst thing in that chat is when I'm like, hey, did this? Do you think this thing sucked? And Brian's like, I loved it, and then I'm like, I don't know anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, both of our answers. I, really, I, I hate when I come to that chat either really loving something or really hating something because I'm really nervous. That yeah, there's going to be a point of contention. Uh, Neve and I both find this film to be meh. Yeah hard meh it's just it's so weird we both saw the trailer and the trailer's really good yeah like that is a punchy trailer really? it has because me and michelle watched trailer and we were like mm. really i was just so the into music that trailer was so uh, corny i'm just so into the premise the idea of like it being like la kind of art circus uh, circuit um with like curators and just art buyers and just that and critics f- and critics and that fakeness and that facade and then making that the place for a horror film like it's the idea is like the paintings come alive and kill them in a way a way that's kind of like layers of fear that video game every time i was watching it I was like layers of fear did this better but um it, it was just really disappointing because it's got like a huge cast of amazing actors yep like jake gyllenhaal is great and i was like ooh, J- like jake gyllenhaal in a genre film who does he play um, he's the main character. He's like Mort Mort. What's yeah. his name? Morph. Mort. Morph. I think it's yeah, Morph. Morph. Uh, he plays an art critic. I, and... We just found a name for my imaginary son that you two are gonna raise. Morph. Morph. <laughs> and he looks so weird because like he looks kind of like gangly and like meek looking, but he's still like shredded. He's super shredded. So he looks like an Instagram influencer dude, where it's like a nerd who just got ripped because he was in LA. And he's, it's a good look. And his, like, mannerisms are great, like, uh, and he's, like, there's an interesting character stuff where he's, like, he's gay or he's bi and he's struggling with his bisexuality and kind of stuff like this. Really? Like, I, I guess so. I feel like an L.A. art critic would have a lot of options in that regard. Got, yeah, but that's well, what it kind so of turns many, into. <laughs> he's got so many options. But, um, so his, like, character was, like, all the all the characters were interesting it just none of it landed it was so flat like so unbelievably flat for a horror movie which has you know a sequence of different style killings you know like usually there's four or five murders per horror movie Mm -hmm. done in different styles found a lot of them very underwhelming and disappointing completely because what you would assume is happening because what they what happens the plot is they find a stash of dead painters paintings and they're like okay we can sell them and build up this big narrative about this guy and they're bit there's bidding wars for millions and millions and you feel like they're going to get their comeuppance because his, ex- his expressed wish was that all the paintings would be burned and destroyed but they were taken by these like like art curators and the paintings are cursed and you think like people are going to die in interesting ways or ways that are kind of match the character in some way and some sort of ironic punishment yeah and they kind of do but they never really do no the first guy and again he was an interesting character he like had little airpods in his ears all the time and he was really wound up by the fact that he wasn't an artist anymore and he was working as a art fitter and he was just like, you know, I'm an artist. And he was really wound up by that. His painting was like monkeys working on a car that just killed him. Like there was nothing to do with any of the character development they were giving him. Did the monkeys kill him? Yeah, the, the monkeys in the painting came alive and pulled him into the painting. Yeah, and they, they kind, of, kind of look like the monkeys in Jumanji. Mm. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that 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 I feel like that's like the first thing you think of. You know, like, there was no... I feel like a good death needs to go through a few passes. They, yeah. they've, they've, they've got different versions of art. So, like, um, they have paintings. They have a t-shirt print. They have a tattoo. They have sculptures. Because art is subjective. Because at the, at the end, there's a character who's getting rid of their art. But then I was like, but that architecture building is really not... Yeah. I, I, I didn't understand the rules of what is and isn't art because it's so subjective. Wait, all art could kill so. 
Well, it was kind of like originally the paintings that were doing it, but by then the final few deaths, they weren't anything to do with the guy's paintings anymore. The it paintings, just became yeah. the art. The, art uh, killed them. The uh, paintings would be in a gallery and then a, a neutral other person's art would become possessed and kill the victim. I'd be pretty happy if my art killed someone. There's too many characters in this movie. Like, why Why? Why is John Malkovich in this movie? I don't know. His role is so weird. He's just like an ex-best friend, an artist who was an alcoholic and now he isn't. And that's just his thing, but he's nothing to do with anyone else, really. It's just like, there's John Malkovich. And you're like, okay. And, Got him. And, and then 30 minutes towards the end, are like, you can leave this movie now. And he's like, I will. And, and, so, <laughs> and so he leaves. And that's it. And the main character just kind of is in a scene and then isn't. Mm-hmm. That's that's how you that's how you film that movie. Same guy who made uh, Nightcrawler, which I saw in the cinema and I love Nightcrawler. Yeah, yeah I, I thought that was last movie that had tension out the wazoo. Yeah, this he, has none. He made a film last year as well that also takes place in L.A. because he has like a trilogy of like weird L.A. movies where it's just like. People who aren't like you in LA, up to no good. Mm-hmm. You guys said that the deaths are pretty lame. Yeah. What do you guys yeah. think is like a good a film with good deaths? I think the poetic irony part has to kind of come true. I think, I mean, for as crap Saw is, it sometimes tr- churns out some good deaths. Yeah. Um, I, I think Seven has some mm-hmm. really good deaths in Seven. I love the Final Destination deaths. Yes. Yeah. So uh, fucking some of them yeah. Are really fun. Um, I like the ones in like Evil Dead Two and things like that like I, 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 I do like I like when a lot of, humans I, are bags of meat and I like a lot of them the, against uh, the, wall. the Freddy Krueger deaths I like <laughs> mm. I think they're, yeah. they're super fun they're really really ironic yeah Um. or like uh, House of a Thousand Corpses has some gross I've never seen that uh, that's the Rob Zombie one yeah, right? yeah. some body horror stuff <clears throat> uh, I don't know anything that f- like if it doesn't matter how it's done as long as there's like tension or there's some narrative to it at least like if there if it's just going to be a blatant killing then let it at least be tense yeah. and if it's going to have some kind of narrative to it at least have it be associated with the characters like one of the main characters in this Josefina she gets the most screen time and then her debt is based around one line she says at the end and it was just this throwaway thing and it just felt really phoned in and lame and lazy and I was like you spent so long with this character and there's so much ways you could give her comeuppance and this is how it happened yeah do you know a death that always scared the shit out of me do you ever see scary movie 3 yes yeah. Pamela Anderson's death at the start of that when someone spins her around and like it's meant to look really goofy so they've like elongated her jaw yeah, but so it, it, it looks, does look fucked but it actually looks really fucked up okay the deaths in the scary movie films are better than the deaths in Velvet Buzzsaw. Yeah, of oh, cool. Like, like yeah. the one of Ray where he's like peeking through the glory hole and then like he gets impaled. <laughs> On a dick. <laughs> yeah, going through his ears. Like that's such a good death. That is, I didn't know that could happen. <laughs> yeah. It can. Jesus. So that's a firm thumbs down on Velvet Buzzsaw. Would yeah. you guys call it the worst Dragon Ball Z movie so far? Not the worst. Like, I think the fourth one's probably the worst. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, it's in the bottom pile. Okay, yeah. Right above Return of Lord Slug. <laughs> if even. <laughs> oh. Um, I wanted to shout out a little anime I've been watching called High Score Girl. That's a cute show. You watched it? Yeah, I've watched the first two episodes. Um, that show is really deceptively good. By the end of it, I really, like, I cared about those characters a lot, and I thought it was really sad. It's about this kid, and he's really good at arcade games, and then he meets a girl who is a mute, and she is really good at arcade games, but then, get this, he meets another fucking girl later on. What? Yep. I didn't know that was going to happen. Yep. And it, it takes place in the early 90s. It takes place in the early 90s, and is all centered around, like, 90s arcade culture. And... It's tricky because, like, I feel like there's a lot in there that I guess, like, if you weren't into that scene, like, you might not get. But I also think, like, the story is actually kind of, like, 
there's no point where like it was really blowing me away but I felt like every episode it was kind of gradually building up the characters and their relationship in that like I really kind of I really gave a shit towards the end like it was really kind of nice and it touches on all these really like interesting things like um it's one part where he wants to get into the same school as the girl because he really likes her but he's kind of dumb so he can't do it and when that happens his arcade skills go to shit because all of a sudden he feels really inadequate and that kind of plays a part in their relationship then his relationship with other people and there was like interesting kind of character stuff in it like it it went so much further than like oh there's guile from street fighter you know what i mean yeah yeah because like this did come out for the 25th anniversary of yep. the capcom collection and from the first street episode I, I genuinely thought it was going to be an ad for street fighter but like it's it's not it's like this really loving homage to like just all of arcade culture and the characters were just like kind of more interesting than you ever think they will be from early on and unfortunately like there's 12 episodes now it ends on a complete cliffhanger and but they have announced that there's three OVAs coming and I'm really excited because this is a super super sweet show it looks weird there's like it has a weird kind of 3D thing going yeah, on it's mm. 3D cell shaded um i think it works yeah like it's not an amazing looking show but it's doing its own thing and i respect that and like it's well directed do the arcades look good yeah yeah okay. and um like they have the actual gameplay from all these like really cool games like it's some like you know dark stalkers coming out as a plot point and they're all like oh dark stalkers oh and it's like it's <laughs> fucking it's really really funny but um, I just wanted to shout that out because, like, it's on Netflix. I don't see a whole lot of people talking about it. And I really, really liked it. Brian. Yeah. Why don't you tell us about Russian Doll? I watched some of this. Yeah, do you, do you watch it yet? Maybe? No, it's on my watch list. Uh, it came out over the weekend, uh, which is the same weekend as Groundhog Day. You know, the the, the real Groundhog Day, not the Bill Murray film. Mm-hmm. Um. And it's very much leaning into that without overtly saying it. Yeah. Because it is about a woman who uh, keeps getting her life reset. Um, except in this instant, it's for as long as she can live. And when she dies, she gets sent back to a respawn point uh, at her birthday party. Yeah. It stars uh, Na, um, Na, Natasha. Na, Tasha Leon, who I love. She's in the American Pie movies and Orange is the New Black and... But I'm a cheerleader, which is a fucking brilliant film. Um, so I'll watch anything that she's in. I really, really, really like her. I'd love to see her do like uh, an animated movie. And she's got such mm. a fantastic voice. Yeah, she does. Uh, she can't say cockroach per- uh, uh, like properly. She says cockroach. That's cute. Yeah. Oh, she, and like she's so small and angry, and her hair is huge, and she's just got such a good design. She does. Um, and they've really, really set up the party nicely where there's all these characters with their own storylines going. She keeps coming back to the same party, right? Yep. Um, and there's bits in the first episode where she's in a, a convenience store, but there's two different things happening in the aisles. And I'm only halfway through the series, but they haven't been explored at all. So, like... It does feel like a video game, and her character is a video game programmer. You know what? It feels a little like a David Cage game. Yeah, it like does. in concept, yeah, not in anything else. And like, so like, she can't use the stairs at the party at the apartment that she's at because she keeps falling down the stairs and dying. So if she needs to leave the party, she has to go outside and go down the fire escape. So there's preset ways she can die? Loads. Yeah, loads. Okay. And she dies many times. But then around her, the world is starting to decay a little bit. Yeah, so like she's at the party and like there's a fruit bowl and she notices that time is resetting but the fruit continues to rot. Yeah. Oh. And uh, where I've gotten to it now, she's gotten in an elevator and there is the camera kind of holds on another guy. But then the elevator starts to malfunction and then they're all going to fall to their death. And she's like, for fuck's sake. But she looks at the guy next to him and he's as calm as she is. So He's in the game too. Yeah, he's also in a time loop. So um, I, I kind of came in and out of this one. 
Uh, Michelle watched the whole series in 24 hours. Fuck yeah, that's how you do it. And she really, really enjoyed it. Didn't, could not have enough good things to say about it. Are you enjoying it, Brian? I love it. I think it's great. Yeah, it's... I, I, I was pretty entertained with what I saw. It's a really, really interesting approach to the Groundhog Day formula as well. Totally. Cause like, no, but like, it does feel like a video game. Yeah, yeah, because there's like rules you have to follow. Yeah. But like not... I think a lot, sometimes when they do that in like films and TV, I feel like it's so... It feels so arbitrary and fake, but in this, it, it feels really kind of just natural part of the story. And she's like constantly exploring dialogue options with characters because she keeps restarting it. <laughs> Which I think is really, really interesting. Yeah. And there's a bunch of overlap with characters where she'll go home with one character, but then she might go home with a different character and the results are different. Yeah. Or she might just completely skip the party altogether or else she'll try and see how long she can live before something else happens to her. Yeah. And some of the ways she dies are like, they're really tragic, but because it's going to reset, they're really funny. Yeah. And, and she's kind of like playing with the rules of the world as well which I think is always kind of funny because mm. like you, you know how when you're in a video game you don't know what to do you do kind of mm. dick around with the NPCs and stuff yeah. like that what do, you, what do you guys think you'd do if you had a Groundhog Day? Murder spree fuck we're Brian. straight to it <laughs> yeah fuck it why no, not no like no. I, I, I get there absolutely oh but, my god but straight away uh, let's you guys say... are such psychopaths we're not at all we okay. just have a healthy respect for taking okay. the but lives of you're, okay everything gets reset but you still have to cause suffering to someone in that moment or do I yeah Neve, Neve you're gone oh my oh, god oh Neve, you're so fucking gone I might, yeah. I might start and end my murder spree at Neve. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay okay so we oh, your are tail all... is fucking good. Okay, so we're all agreed that we're going to go on a murder spree in our time loop. Yeah, paradox. Yeah, yeah. we're okay. all agreed. Okay, but how many like resets until we start murder spree? Okay, because for you it sounded like one. No, no, no. Like I'm being realistic and knowing that like I'm going to get there eventually, <laughs> but it's going to take about a hundred goes until I get there. Oh man! And is that because like you've been driven mad by the constant yeah. resets, and yeah, you're yeah. like, you see, uh, and you're like, okay, let me try and break this because I can deal with that a bit more than you just being like, well, looks I wouldn't like do I'm it right murder. away. I, it would take me a couple goes, like, because because you know how you have to go through different motions. But I know I'm going to get there eventually, and I have to be honest. Like you, you know how we all have our zombie apocalypse kind of scenarios in our head because of all the media we've consumed yeah. that, 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 that we all kind of have you know a a conclusion in our head that we're gonna have to do something awful i feel like zombie apocalypse scenarios get way less fun when you're in like a committed loving relationship Nah, she's gone down because <laughs> <laughs> i used to have all these ideas and i'm like oh, i guess i'll fucking make sure michelle's okay yeah well, you, yeah, you, you got to make sure they're okay. But, but anyway, but, Groundhog like, Day. Soon as okay, okay Gr- Groundhog Day. Okay, okay. Let's take Murder Spree, put it aside. How long till, like, just fucking orgy spree? Oh, that's the first thing I'd do. Jesus. Jesus, Steve. <laughs> How come that's fucked? Because <laughs> you got to respect the sanctity of marriage. <laughs> 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 okay, you know, you know, I'm, I'm not sure which should come first for me. Both within the first five days, for sure. I think you'd be naked killing people. Yeah, I could Woo! see that. That would yeah. be so scary. Just you naked with a pair of Crocs on running at people. Why a pair of Crocs? Because you're fucking weird, John. Yeah. You're weird. You, yeah, like what kind of person I owns Crocs? See, I could see like a mask or something, but Look, Crocs? I wouldn't wear Crocs. <laughs> Brian, your Crocs are fine while you're clothed, but when you're naked and running at someone, you know what? I don't need Crocs. You know what, Neve? You're selling me on this idea of naked Crocs. It's just extra spree. terrifying. You, you, uh, I think, like, borrow my Crocs. Being fully if you naked, want. but wearing socks or something. I'd like a, I'd like Crocs a mask. Socks. I'd like a mask as well. A ma- just like 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 a Albert Einstein mask and like socks and Crocs <laughs> and just running around town going oh and murdering people. <laughs> what noise? Do you see what noise is that? Yeah. Just could you just do it one more time? It's kind of just like oh. <laughs> 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 Eve, Come on. Eve. <laughs> No, I'm making Leave. love to people. <laughs> yeah, make, make, make one. Make the noise. <laughs> <laughs> so, Neve, you're in a big fucking pile of lesbians or whatever you're in, and then all of a sudden you just hear from outside. <laughs> it's a big pile of lesbians and one guy who's like... <laughs> just a guy being like, oh, actually, you know, I... This is- <laughs> Enjoy your death trap, ladies. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I love that sound. It was hitting the absolute <laughs> rock bottom of this podcast. <laughs> it's a good show. It's a good show. Russian Dolls is a good show. Oh, I can't wait to watch. Yeah. 
enjoy it. It's on Netflix, right? Yeah, it's on yep. Netflix. There's eight episodes. I don't know what's going to happen next. It's written by Natasha and Amy Poehler and the woman who made Bachelorette, which I fucking hate. But, you know, she's written something good, so that's all right. Speaking of Amy Poehler, did either of you guys see the end of Kimmy Schmidt? No, not yet. Okay. But that's Tina Fey. Fuck. Don't confuse them. I think they yeah. thank Amy Poehler in the last episode. Did she Fair die? <laughs> no, I think she just, like, she had some hands in <laughs> okay, there or something. Cool. I can't probably remember. Some she's probably some producer. Yeah, because they're buds, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, they are. Yeah. Alumni. Because um, she, she's definitely in the credits of the final. But anyway, um, I watched the final season. Uh, my informant tells me it was a little spotty, a little inconsistent. But fuck, there were some laughs in those last two episodes that, like, that kind of broke me a little bit. Like, I, I don't know what it is about Kimmy Schmidt, but there is something about that sense of humor where sometimes the jokes fall so flat to me, and sometimes I have to pause the show and recollect myself because I'm laughing so hard. And there's some... <laughs> oh no. There's a really fucking good Billy Crystal joke <laughs> in that second last episode. Oh man, that um, guy needs to be taken down a notch. Oh Boy, they sure get him. America's sweetheart, you're going down. Um, that dude shows up in it, who was in American Horror Story, played Siler in Heroes. Zachary Quinto. Zachary mm. Quinto. He shows up in the last couple episodes. That dude is fucking great. I love that guy. He's a scream. He is a scream, Brian. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, that's me recommending the last two episodes of Kimmy Schmidt. So just watch no one out context. Yeah, just no context. Just dive right in there. And imagine the John's way. beside you going. <laughs> <laughs> Strategy talk. Oh my god. Okay. I think we need something to take us down a little bit. Yeah. Neve, tell us about Anthem. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Take us real down. Right down. Yeah, right down. Right down into the shitter. Um, so Anthem is Bioware EA's multiplayer role-playing loot shooter. Awesome. How many aliens can I bone? None. Absolutely none. No, sorry, Eve. I just, I said Anthem. That's the Bioware one in the docket. Yeah, the Bioware sci-fi game. Um, Bioware, for some reason, or EA, thought, well, people like Bioware because of their good shooting mechanics and not because you can bone aliens. And now we have Anthem to play. Huh. So, uh, I'm a huge Bioware fan. I've been playing every Bioware title since Neverwinter Nights in 2002-ish, probably. Jeez, yeah. yeah. Christ. Wow. I'm day one Bioware fan, and I played the VIP demo for Anthem. Um, it, it was patchy. So, first thing, it's a loot shooter. It's basically a Destiny, or that's what they want it to be. So, you play with your friends, you do raids, you get loot you repeat the cycle and you go through that the demo was patchy there was loading glitches you would get at 90 percent loading bar and it would just freeze there and the only way to get into the game would be to exit out of your app reload get a prompt that was like hey you're on expedition want to rejoin and rejoin with your team so you would miss all the kind of narrative they were throwing at you any of the kind of prompts just the beginning of the missions right uh, so that wasn't great. Good thing environments looked lovely. They were really, really nice and colourful with nice flora and fauna and alien life forms and stuff. There was a really big surprise of you dive underwater and there's a whole other area to the map where you're underwater and that was not something I expected. Uh, you, you play as a... you're a freelancer, that's what they're called. And you get a mech suit, and they're called javelins, and that's how you explore the world. That sounds like good fake sci-fi lingo. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's kind of like the same story as Mass Effect, though. It's kind of like Prothean technology, like they find ancient aliens. yeah ancient alien technology, and now there's a war for the technology. So you know, familiar territory for Bioware. Uh, the javelins look cool, like conceptually. I don't know if I love their design from a functionality standpoint. You can pick a male or a female character at the start. There's no way your characters can fit into some of these javelins. Like, there's, some of them are smaller than the body type of the character you can pick. Mm. Like, um, there's, there's four different javelins. There's Ranger, which is just your normal gunner guy. Storm, which is your elementalist. Um, Colossus, which is your tank damage dealer kind of guy. And Interceptor, which is your ninja. Um, the interceptor is tiny and has a tiny little, like, clearly female shape to it. 
and all the other ones like have a more male shape to it and it's like who the fuck is in these mechs and the legs are broken like it's just bad sci-fi from that standpoint there's clearly no one getting in this thing if the central revolving thing of this game is the javelins i could see how that piss you off yeah like i think in there's ways around that like you could download your conscious into the javelins or something like that you didn't have to get into a suit but whatever but they look generally cool i think a big part of this game is going to be customization of these things they have like material shaders they have color shaders and all of that stuff was really fun to play around in the demo but the demo is not kind of analogous to how that's going to play out because they had everything cost 25 gold in the demo and they were like, we've met everything cost this price. So you don't know how much you're going to have to grind to get gold to buy anything. Sure. And I presume this is going to be a grind loop because they have, you know, currency that you can buy or you can you can unlock everything in game, but it depends how bad that grind is. Um, I played with about 10, 15 people who had made their mech look like Iron Man. I get the reference. Um, <laughs> the best thing in Anthem was the mobility. You can fly in it. And that felt cool. Like, it was... Can, can you can you cover a lot of distance? Yeah, the maps are huge and they look gorgeous. So you can, there's a lot of verticality in them. Yeah. But the best thing is the flying. It's on a, like, you can overheat. So they can take away your flying ability. And your overheat, if you do overheat, it takes a while before you get cool again, before you can use your flying again. So I kind of don't know why they've um, kind of hamstrung kind of maybe the most interesting aspect of the game. Mm. Um, This being like a Destiny kind of what keeps me on Destiny is it plays good. The shooting is nice. The shooting in this feels really crappy. Yeah. Like just no punch to it, no feedback. And like, I don't know, it's... I guess it's Bioware shooters. Like, you're doing stuff on screen for sure and numbers are popping, but like... I think you said something to me over the weekend about getting Bioware to build a shooter was a huge mistake. That's like asking... Or or like how uh, Bungie had experience with shooters. They build a shooter because they're good at shooters and they're getting Bioware to do that and that is not their forte. No, not at all. Like, I don't think anyone has ever reviewed a Mass Effect game and went hey, the shooting's great. No, like, you the know. best you get is, the shooting is dot, dot, dot better. Yeah, exactly. And like, it's always been improving as they've been going on making games, but it's never been like why you play those games. Um, and just like, like I thought, okay, well, my auto rifle doesn't feel good. I'll switch to a shotgun. No punch to the shotgun. I'll switch to the sniper rifle. No punch to the sniper rifle. And it was an automatic sniper rifle, which I thought was really weird. I picked up three different sniper rifles and all of them were automatic. You know, you kind of want that one single shot, real powerful sniper, and that wasn't there. It probably will be something that will drop, but I don't know if that will feel any better. Um, Every javelin gets its specials, Uh, so this is kind of what I did like. The shooting didn't feel good, but the specials felt pretty good. I played the storm javelin the most, and you had elemental, so you could freeze enemies, you could set them on fire, you could drop earth on them and that felt good and it looked cool and the cooldowns were really generous so you could do it a lot what kind of um what kind of enemies are you fighting they kind of they're varied enough like that's one of the good things about the nice environments as well is there's a lot of stuff the enemies look varied like there was like giant dragons flying around and then what you were finding was like all like like the scar and they they're humanoid-esque, but then there was another thing that just kind of looked like the Taken from Destiny. Yeah. But these, like, you know, they had flying things. There was a bit more... It was more visually interesting, at least. I, If that's all that's there, though, then... I don't know how much they were kind of showing for this demo. Some really, really annoying just multiplayer stuff, because this is a multiplayer game. I crash. I was consistently crashing out, like, all the time. Uh, so I was playing with a friend and we crashed out at the n- end of a stronghold and that's their raids and we just crashed out just as the bo- boss was nearly dead so we could join in again but they ported us behind a door so just a closed door into the boss's arena so we met it back into the stronghold but we couldn't go help our, our teammates both of them were downed we can't wipe until all of us are downed that is infuriating yeah we couldn't help them respawn they were just stuck there and that happened uh, our stronghold mission crashed three times in the same place and that's kind of the biggest issue with this uh, anthem right now is it's just super 
fucking buggy. Like, it's so buggy. It's so glitchy. The menus feel clunky. A lot of ease of use and quality of life stuff in the menus aren't there. Like, they're not intuitive. You go to launch a quest, you click on it on the map, you feel like you could go into a menu from there. No, you have to exit out of that to launch after you've selected something on the map. You, all your guns are being held for you at the hub. You can't go through them while you're out in the field and switch your guns. It feels slow and even the movement speed, which they said they'll fix in the hub area, feels slow. Neil, let me ask you a question. Say they patch up all the loose parts of Destiny, all the crashing, all the performance issues, all Anthem. that kind of stuff. Anthem, Anthem sorry. Mm -hmm. Is there, like, is there a worthwhile game if they do that? Or is your problem more with how the game actually is? You see, if they patched up all the glitches and stuff, I still think the shooting feels bad. But my bigger issue is, I guess there'll be a narrative because there's Bioware. And there was NPCs that you can talk to and you could pick, you know, responses to them. They felt weird. They felt like another company trying to do Bioware. They felt really, really overly friendly. Like there was a girl who talks to you before you get into your javelin. And I was like, is she flirting with me? Um, and then she's like, I'm my kid and my husband. And I was just like, why does she talk like that? And every character has that really over familiar, jokey kind of dialogue. I found that a lot in Mass Effect 3. Mm. And that and when I looked into it, it was because the one of, one of the two lead writers had left after Mass Effect 2. Because I felt like Mass Effect 2 kind of had some gravity to it. Like there was some kind of... There was some pathos to the characters, and I felt that really missing in Mass Effect 3, and it kind of sounds like that problem's continuing. It was in Andromeda as well, yeah. and it's kind of like, I don't mind that, like, chirpy, quirky dialogue if it's a character that speaks like that. But it, this is every character. Every character talks in that voice. Yeah, every yeah. character, like, there was puns everywhere. There was, like, you know, you gotta crack a few eggs to make an omelette. Like, there was just... It was just... But you do, Neve. Ugh. Oh. Every time you could think you could call what they were going to say, what kind of quip they were going to say, you'd be right. Yeah. Like, it was I, uh, so yeah. basic level quippy. And I was like, if this is like... like, Because that's what would probably keep me there is if the narrative was good. I don't know if I like what they're selling me. Also, the NPCs in the world all have the same body template. Like, all the males have, like, the same kind of shape. All the <clears throat> females have the same shape. It's just... Like, it doesn't look like a world no it feels like an online hub yeah it feels fucking fake yeah. you know and plasticky and weird and when you're in that hub area there's a lot of like characters popping there's a lot of like settling there's a lot of texture popping it just feels a bit half baked in there and if that's where your narrative is going to happen like i don't i don't know that's not selling me either on it yeah yeah and this game's out in march this is out this month, 22nd. Of February? Yeah. Ooh, yeesh. Pretty sure. Yeah, like they haven't called this a beta, they've called this a demo. Mm -hmm. And I think the demo's kind of gone live now as well. Like, I think people who... Like, there's loads of different ways to play this, so I think there's some people who can play this fully now. Wow. Okay, because... It's interesting, because there's that other sci-fi game that we'll get to talk to talk about in a while yeah. that came out over the weekend. And Yeah, boy, that sure fucking dropped. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. But, um... It's weird because, like, a lot of this stuff, I'm getting real, like, deja vu for the first Destiny, for the release of that. And it's weird because I feel like, I feel like that's just the game plan now. Like, release an incomplete game and then build it into a complete game. Um, I guess so, but with the first Destiny, it always felt good to play. And Very it true. wasn't buggy. It was low on content, for sure. And the grind sucked ass, but it was never bad to... F it didn't have a bad game feel. Yeah, you know what? I guess you're right. Yeah. Um, I did one of the strongholds in this. I heard there's only going to be three strongholds at launch. So that's three raids. I feel like you could do all that content in a week. So they better have a really long developed roadmap for this game. Because people who like these games and stuff like Destiny eat content. You yeah, know? totally. And what's important is the end game. So they better have that stuff there or this, like, Anthem will die. And I'm not, like, opposed to Anthem being good. I would love this game to be good. I quite like the flying and I quite like the environments. I'm holding off. I cancelled my pre-order. I'm holding off to see how this reviews because right now it feels like a glitchy, buggy mess and it feels like 
the best parts of Bioware are not there and the worst bites, parts of Bioware are there. Sounds like it's got like a long way to go. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Brian, yeah. you played the newest Dragon Ball Z game, Dragon Ball Z Ocarina of Time? That's the Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. Sorry. God damn it. Uh, I'm replaying this game because I haven't played it in 20 years. Well, that's not true. I played the 3DS version. But that version. is That version is so optimized yeah, and yeah. everything is redone assets-wise that it doesn't really compare to the to the N64 version, but I'm playing an N64 ROM of it on the Wii U because I wanted to play this game and I didn't know how I was going to play original Ocarina of Time. Then I realized I actually have a bunch of copies of it physically on a shelf. I just own that game a whole bunch. Yeah, it, it kind of happens like that. I'm a couple hours in. Uh, I've done all childhood or child link. So I've done the first three dungeons and all that stuff holds up pretty well. There's a few kind of like suspension narrative bit beats where you're kind of like, oh, okay, that doesn't make sense to go to this location and talk to this character right now. But sure. Because like there's a bit where like Saria gives you an ocarina when you leave the village as, as Kid Link. She's your childhood friend. And then you talk to Princess Zelda, and then for no reason at all, Navi, your fairy, who tells you what to do, goes, we should talk to Saria about this. And you're like, why? I, I, I'm I going to a different place. That is, That was what a lot of like adventure games were like in that era. <clears throat> like, even when I was replaying, and this is, I guess, a bit later, but even when I was uh, playing through Yakuza Kiwami 2, there was a bunch of bits like that where I was like, but there's no reason I'd... Yeah. Okay, you know, and I just go. Yeah, um, because it's such a low poly game as well. The geometry of like where you, where you need to go in a dungeon is so easy. So like you know, oh, I can cross this gap or I can go over here because mm. it's so simplified. Yeah. Whereas I find with like the new modern age Zeldas, it's very easy to kind of cheese your way through an area mm. or go. Can I make this gap? I don't know if I can because they have it so organically designed now. Yeah. Uh, but this is it's very just brick by brick like you're walking around Minecraft yeah and I kind of like that like god I the more I think of those dungeons from Breath of the Wild the more I hate them they, like, they're they're garbage they're terrible dungeons yeah. the dungeons in this game are absolutely yeah, fantastic yeah they're fucking they're, they're still good um, so now I'm adult Link and I have finished the forest temple dungeon but I have not beaten the boss and what I'm doing now is uh, I have started the second dungeon, which is the Fire Temple, but I'm actually going ahead and I'm going to do the uh, underwater dungeon, the the, the the water temple. Without beating the boss, like you're not going to beat the boss of the Fire Temple. I want to see if I can play the dungeon sort of out of order. Brian, that's wild. Because I think as long as you have the bow and arrow and the hook shot, you can kind of go ahead to other areas and activate things. That makes sense. I guess the only thing you wouldn't be able to do is the Ganon Bridge at the end. Yeah. Do you want to hear one of the one of the most burning comments anyone ever said to me in my childhood? It was one of my friends, I think it was actually my cousin, and we were arguing about something. And I said something mean to him, I don't remember what it was, and he turns around and he goes, if it wasn't for me, you'd still be in the fucking water temple. <gasps> he got you there. <laughs> he did. Um, this game is definitely aged, but it's completely playable. Uh, I'm. How long did they spend telling you about Z targeting? I find. Oh, I find. I find the Z targeting super interesting because, like, that's such a like staple now in third person games. Yeah, I, uh, I remember playing it first and being like, "All right." Uh, but like, they need to really explain that you know you have a fairy. The fairy will fly over and highlight something, and you press the Z button, and then you can circle around it. And like, they need like a character. To represent this. Yeah. Like, you know how in Mario 64, there was two characters in that game. There was Mario and there was Lakitu, mm. the camera guy. And, like, it makes a point that you're playing as two characters throughout the game. And this is kind of the same thing. Um, and, like, the first area of the game, which is the Kokiri Forest, like, it, it, like, it, it is a very safe area. There's nothing there that can really hurt you uh, outside of a few enemies. But, like, it, it, it is just easing you in to... 3D. Yeah. Well, 
Let's hope Goku and the gang manage to save the day somehow. I'm sure they will. It's also a very easy game. Neve, you've been playing Final Fantasy fourteen. Sure have. Yeah. I'm back. Because I saw you playing this, and for a second I was like, is she fucking playing fifteen? But no. then I saw it was fourteen, and I was like, oh, okay. I went deeper. So there was a Paris event where they talked about what's coming in the next expansion for Final Fantasy fourteen. And there's two things that piqued my interest. First, new class, Gunblade. No way. That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So it's a tank class. You get your Gunblade. I am pretty into that as a concept. Then the real thing that got me was there will be a new raid. It will be a Nier Automata raid designed by Yoko Taro. Sick. That's awesome. That's really, really cool. Noise. But I need to be level 80 (laughs) and get through all the expansions before I can play that. Um, But now I have a few friends who are um, all caught up and pretty high level Final Fantasy XIV players. So I was like, okay, I have some people who can help me through this game. They have like carried me through dungeons already. I have made a female Highlander Lancer for the people that interests and I'm having a blast. I think that game, when you have someone telling you what's what or what's important and kind of just to hold your hand at the start is so much better. Cause when I went in blind, cause I've, I've played this before. When I went in blind, I was so confused. The UI is so all over the place and not nice. They were like, look, attach a mouse and a keyboard to your PlayStation. And I did, and everything's easier. Uh, so I'm playing with the controller, but using my mouse to deal with the UI and communicating via the keyboard. Huh. But sure. uh, it's just a way to make that game way more comfortable. And I'm I'm just having a great time. I really love my class. I love Lancer. Um, and I am hoping the expansion Shadowbringer is going to be out in July 2nd. I am hoping I will be level 80 and through all that four years of narrative content by that time. I'm sure you remember, will. I've heard nothing but good things about that game for years now do you remember when that game was a disaster yeah remember when that game was like square enix's biggest fuck up the no clip documentary on how it turned around is really really good it's like what's weird about that is i've been like catching up on all the lore i think the kind of lore from the 1.0 stuff was was a better beginning lore than the new stuff but uh, but they used the lore to kind of launch the second game. Yeah, and I thought that was cool, the idea that something was coming to wipe out the world and then mm. the world was going to be the game redone. That was that was fun. Guys, I have played more Travis Strikes again. And um, I'd only played a little bit. I think I'm coming up to about halfway in the game now. It's weird because, like, the more I play it, the more I agree with the negative reviews, it is really repetitive. Like, it is. The gameplay is very simplistic. But the more I play it, the more I kind of fall in love with this game as well. This game has shit going on. Like, it is... I can't put my finger on it yet, but there is something, like, more happening here. Did you hear what they did with the opening trailer? No. They patched out the opening trailer and replaced it with a new one. And the new one is someone visiting <coughs> Badman, who is Bad Girl's daughter... Mm -hmm. Badman is the second playable character. He's coming to Travis Touchdown's place to kill him. And it's someone telling him where Travis Touchdown lives. And how it turns out to be is one of the assassins from Killer7. Sweet. So now Killer7 and No More Heroes exist canonically in the same universe. So it's one of the Smiths? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So Uh, do you think they're going to be patching stuff into this? I don't know. Because the game is like... I, there's a lot of weird stuff going on. Like the first, the first, le- the first kind of big boss encounter, and you know, for me, it's a No More Heroes game. It fucking lives and dies on its boss encounters. The first boss encounter is Travis Touchdown getting sucked into a video game that he used to love, and having to kill the his like childhood hero just because he loves killing. And that could easily just be shit, but it's this weird thing where Travis Touchdown is like. I don't know, maybe he's been, like, out in the forest for years. Because this is set, like, I think 14 year, years or something after No More Heroes 2. And he's kind of crazy now. And, like, he has all this bloodlust because he's an assassin. But he's also really sad about, like, having to kill this character he used to love. And it's, like, it was really good. And there was, like, proper weight to it. And so I did that. And then 
After that, I have to get on Travis's motorbike and, like, watch some backstory, which is all presented through a text adventure. Literally a visual novel, where you hit A for half an hour and just scroll through all this dialogue. Which would be infuriating if the dialogue weren't really, like, good and entertaining. Cat has had this... Cat... Your... Got my words this evening. Travis has had this cat, Jean, since the first No More Heroes. For some reason in this game, Jean can talk. Oh, yeah. And just has an attitude now. And it's so strange. And, like, a lot of weird love has gone into the game as well. Each of the six worlds you go into, they all have their own opening cutscene. And so there's an opening cutscene for No More Heroes. There's an opening cut. There's the alternate Killer Seven No More Heroes opening. Then there's the opening for um, the first game, which is like just this really cool CG opening, really cinematic, really interesting. The second one is for like a horror game, and it's like this weird live action trailer for like it looks like a horror movie, except then it's a video game, and you're going around to all these houses and looking at like all these murder scenes and stuff. All you're really doing in these places is killing stuff. The gameplay is not really where it's at, except the boss fights, which are really fun. But I'm, I'm kind of having a blast with this game. And I get why people like it. I get bored with it. I get frustrated with it. But I think it's fucking cool. Like, I think games... This is like a weird Dreamcast PlayStation 2 game. And I don't think you really get games like that anymore. You get weird indie games, for sure. But you don't get weird games like this. And I... I think it's fucking awesome. Like, I'm having a great time with this. I'm really excited to play more. And every time I sit down with it, like, I don't know... I don't know what's going to happen. And I love that feeling. Sounds good. I'm it's pretty cool. You. Yeah, I'm yeah. also happy for me. Brian. Yeah. Why don't you tell us about... Wargroove. Wargroove. Uh, made by Chucklefish Games. It's mm-hmm. uh, an indie game on the Switch. But it's coming to all other systems very soon. And it is a spiritual successor to the Advance Wars series. Boy, is it. A series that I very dearly miss. The last one of those was, like, there's dark conflict, but I'm like, that doesn't really no, count. That, that doesn't have the spirit. No. Uh, so the last last kind of mainline one really was Dual Strike, which came out on the DS in 2005. So that's a long time ago. That's, what, 14 years ago? It's turn-based strategy game. Uh but with a fantasy setting. So it's a bit like Advance Wars. It's a bit like Fire Emblem. Um, but it, it's also got its own thing going on. Yeah, it totally does its own stuff. Yeah. Um, I, I'm well into the campaign and I love it so far. Uh, I love all the commanding officers. They do a cool thing where the commanding officers are actually playable on the map. Yeah, which it, they were not in Advance Wars. No. And they do a thing similar to Fire Emblem, but it's their own kind of version of it. If you have two units that are the same side by side, they'll get a critical hit uh, against their opponent, which is such a good mechanic. Uh, it's got the fog of war. Is that's that's with the spear lads, isn't it? Yep. Is it with other units? Uh, yep. Or do they? Because the spear lads specifically get a critical if they're side by side. There are some other units where, instead of it being like uh, an orange space, it'll be a brown space. And that just means that it's going to be a heavier hit if... Oh, cool. Gotcha. If they attack. Um, it's got cool things where the scouts in it are dogs and you send them up onto mountains. So if you have a fog of war level, then you can see more of the map. It oh, has, that's cool. Um, it's It's got the taking over cities and then you generate income and then you supply your own army, which is very much Advance Wars. Um, and it's interesting because the game is very customizable. Like, you can... Design your own maps, but you can also design your own campaign with dialogue. So can you write the dialogue? Yeah. That's crazy. And can other people play this? or is Yeah. It... What? And you, you, you can upload. So like it's kind of like Mario Maker as well, where you can upload these things. And, it, it, and it's got cross-play and it's all free. Um, so you don't need an online subscription to do this. But you can pull down ones designed for someone who've, who've, who's been playing the PC version or the Xbox version. Um, but I think so far it's only out in Switch Mm. uh, and the portability of it lends it to it super well but the um, but but the campaign and map making system is what they actually use to make the actual campaign in the game so anything you see in the campaign you could recreate 
Yep. That's really fun. And so what people are doing so far is they're recreating Advanced Wars levels, like some of the best ones from 1, 2, and DS. And then same with Fire Emblem, they're recreating Fire Emblem levels. Because because it's a fantasy game, there's interior and exterior maps mm. where you can go into a castle and break down um, doors and take out um, knights inside a castle, and that's completely Fire Emblem. Say if you were never going to touch like the building aspect, would it still be like really fulfilling as a game? Or is a lot of it the fact that you can build your own maps? That's completely secondary to it. Yeah. Like um, um, I picked I, up this game as well. I've I've only played like a little bit of it, but I have no intention of going near the building stuff. But like already, like I feel between like the amount of story, the characters, and like it's a beautiful game. Like the animation yeah, is, animation is much so better than it was in Advance Wars. Yeah. Um. Like, I, I'll probably never design a map. Um. But I will in a few months' time read a best of list and download those. Mm, yeah. How's the difficulty, Brian? Because I remember like. It's it, late game advance wars could be fucking brutal. It's there's one map earlier on and it's very very difficult where you have to be extremely precise as to where you put your characters. Right. Cuz it's a make or break level. Um it's completely customizable with the difficulty. Like you can scale everything to your needs. Okay. Is there permadeath? No. Okay. And there's just like it wouldn't be there's a lot of like producing units, mm. right? Yeah. Yeah, and so like sometimes you do sacrifice units, but the best way to play is you kind of move like five characters as a like a block forward, and you're kind of pushing and pushing across the map is kind of usually my technique for playing. Yeah. But then you will get rewarded stars, and if you do lose a lot of units, then you'll get one star, you won't get any star. So there is like, you know ranking systems for you to go back and play the maps yeah it's it's a really cool little game yeah. and like it's like ridiculously cheap yeah it's like 15 euro or something what? like that yeah. okay i'm picking this they up. could yeah. have charged way more yeah. for that. you should pick it up just for the armored dogs yeah Dave. yeah like, yeah you, you share, shared some of the sprites brian and they look nice yeah and like there's four Niamh's Nieb, 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 in the game there's four different factions as well yeah and like they're all cool i think yeah, I like they are. Them all. um but then there's like races within the faction so there's like there is amphibian fishmen people. And it's like there's tree people. Yeah. Uh, so, but like it's weird because like the tree people are their own country. Yeah. But then there's water based soldiers, so they're amphibians. Mm -hmm. But there's amphibians for each of the four countries. And okay. they all have their own design. And there's golems, but they each have like their own nationality design. Oh, that's cool. I love and, that. And stuff. so, like the dog soldiers, because there's like the like Germanic like traditional European country that you start with and they just have like a Dachshund kind of looking dog or like a Labrador but then there's like an eastern country so they have Shiba Inus Aww. as their, oh, as, as their that, like that's so, like I love that like mm -hmm. little touches like yeah. that in games just make it for me and there's a, a commanding officer who's a dog called Caesar and like he's 100% a dog yep and like the soldiers are following him going like which way do we go boy and yeah. like but like he's like sniffing out like prisoners who've been captured and so you play through his campaign or his, his his story and like they're just like this dog knows what's up we have to follow his lead um and his special ability is that he inspires people yep yeah that this all checks this sounds great yeah it's it's i'm really looking forward to spending more time yeah, with it i i i think everybody should play this game yeah real nice little surprise for yeah. this year and i haven't used my switch in a while no you haven't and maybe you never will because you've got the last game you've ever need neve tell us about apex legends wouldn't that be way better if they just <coughs> called it apex yeah, yeah yeah i'm sure people are just gonna start calling it apex because apex Legends sounds weird either just call it apex predators or apex yeah. Yes. So, um, so this was the surprise sci-fi yeah, release over the weekend. Weird. Okay. Maybe by respawn. I mean, I'm, I'm really super curious as to your take on this game because I've heard things. Uh, this so this is like um this is respawns. Not Titanfall three. Not Titanfall three. This is what they were making. A little, it's set in the Titan uh, Titanfall universe. So if you like, if you kind of remember factions and stuff from Titanfall, they will kind of say those things. Like, there's callbacks to Titanfall. It is a battle royale game, but it is a squad-based battle royale. So you're not a single user. You're in a team of three, and you are automatically paired when 
you join. Obviously, you can um, have your own teams, but you when you enter the game, it pairs you up. It is a 60 person map rather than 100. They said that's basically right now what they're trying out and maybe it will expand. It's a single map. The map is huge, like absolutely huge. And it plays like Titanfall without the mechs and without the wall running. Yeah. Okay. So you can, it's fast. Like if you like you play Titanfall, it's it's kind of twitchy first person um, play. It's like, it's very quick. You have your a slide in this, which can uh, make you pick up speed as well. It's also kind of like, they don't want to use the word, but it's kind of a hero shooter. So you have like eight specific heroes you can pick from. One of them's locked as of now that you will be able to access later, either for as part of like a paid kind of season pass like they're outright calling things seasons so it's kind of like Fortnite. that's the market they're going for i like the character designs they were unexpected yeah. yeah yeah just um like there's two black women which you do not get in video games and outright on the <laughs> first s- one ever probably just, like just <laughs> yeah. a, as an outright eight character like pick from like there's like i was like okay that's cool i I'm not good at this game. I had a child heckle the shit out of me. For Don't a worry, match. Neve. I'll come and help you. <laughs> Thanks, John. Um, known shooter man, John. <laughs> yep, known shoot man aficionado, <laughs> Mister Gun himself. As long so, as he has his right hand man, the snipe, Brian. Yeah. Uh, what's interesting about this is in like trees. in most battle royals, if you die, you're out. Yeah. Um, in this you can you have a class who can revive um, and you can also grab your your downed teammates flag and bring it to a single use like regeneration thing to get them back in the game so normally if you die you're just out and you like restart your battle royale and this you're like shit pick me up get me to a thing and that's why I was heckled because this kid sucked and he kept dying and he was like pick up my flag pick up my flag I'm really good pick it up and I was like nowhere near him I was just like, no kid. And he was just screaming at me over Mike being like, oh my God, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. And I was like, you're already dead. <laughs> it was <laughs> this, just this really sounds annoying. like it's going back to our murder spree conversation. Oh God. It was so like, um, it was very, I was like, I wish you could turn mics off as default, but uh, everything was going too fast. So I couldn't turn him off. So I just had to live with the kid shouting at me. It It's fun to play, but I, again, it's something that you need to, get good at because every time I picked up a gun I turned a corner and walked into someone who had a gun before me I don't know if it's something I will stick with personally I'm not a battle royale person you don't sound like you think it's like a bad product though no I think it plays nice like I think the shooting feels nice and I think the map feels good and it kind of hits a nice in between of kind of having a cartoony feel to it where it's not taking itself too serious it's kind of pretends it's a kind of a game show the lore is light so far but i'm sure they'll build up on that but also like i liked titanfall because i liked the story you know yeah and the gameplay especially the second one yeah and the gameplay was secondary to that like the gameplay was really good and there was really (coughs) really good narrative moments with the gameplay where you poured it in between two times like that time shift i really i love the campaign and in titanfall 2 whole game out of that like that was so good so that kind of like would be what I would like out of that. Um, I think this is going to do well. Like it's fun. Well, I heard they had like a million users in their first 24 hours and then that doubled the next day. I can wow. imagine like like if you want, like if, if you're looking for a console battle royale that's free to play, it's Fortnite or it's this. And I'm sure a lot of Fortnite people want to try something new. Mm. Um, and it looks completely different. Like this is a sci-fi yeah. shooter. It isn't. Yeah, something... I, th- I thought like I'm gonna give this a shot. Yeah, I, like, I like battle royale stuff. I'm bad at them, but I like them. Yeah, I think I'm gonna give it a few more goes because I think if it's something I got into, I could really like. But it's also I'm playing a lot of stuff right now. Yeah, it's been a pretty packed mm. start of the year. Sure, totally. Has. Yeah, one of which the games was a very anticipated game for this podcast: the Resident Evil Two remake. Neve, we have both been playing this. Yes. I think you have played more of it than I have. I have finished my Claire run. I have nearly finished my B, uh, my Leon run. I love it. I'm so happy. It's so good. I am absolutely delighted with every aspect of it. Except for maybe some character stuff, but that's beyond the point. I am really, really enjoying a lot of this game. I think it looks great. I think the shooting is great. I think the 
zombies are genuinely scary. I think the puzzle, the inventory stuff and just the puzzles, fun to do. I am so fast getting through that first area now. I can do it pretty quickly and I'm, I'm having fun with that. Like, I'm like, okay, I need to get this item. I need to do this. This is here. And like, it's just like a giant, the whole game is a giant puzzle to me now rather than individual puzzles. It keeps its tension. Like when you first meet a certain character, I think I think everyone knows. <clears throat> Mr. When you first meet Mr. X, he's so fucking scary, and his eyes are like glue. Like the <laughs> animations in this are so subtly nice. Yeah. He's never stops looking at you. You'll be running around the room, and he'll be going up the stairs, but he'll like crane his neck to keep his eyes on you moving around. Do you know? Do you know what really has me shit in my britches? What? <laughs> when you're in a room, and he's nowhere near you, but you just hear. And you can just hear him stomping around the police mm -hmm. station and you don't know where the fuck he is, but you know he's around. I came in a door, he came in the opposite door at the same time. And there's just a moment where we're both looking at each other. But when he goes through a door, it reminds me of like the tall man from It Follows. Like he holds on yeah. to the top of it and he bends down. Like oh, the gosh. animation's really, really nice. He has a little fedora, Brian. Oh, I, I've seen him. He, he kind of shoot it off his head. He's kind of like Q from Street Fighter a bit. Uh, have you guys seen the compilations? I think it was actually Magma, a friend of mine, um, and it made its rounds. And it's just Mr. X, and when he walks through a door, X gonna give it to you. Starts yep. playing. Yeah. And it's it's so stupid. It's so good. Because uh, it's just like spooky Resident Evil noises, and then yeah, yeah, sorry, go on. He's just like he's so tension inducing. Like. Yeah. And it's funny because he will like fuck other zombies out of the way to get to you. So he was coming down the stairs and I'd managed to get into my safe room. And then a zombie just fell from the top of the stairs because he just <laughs> threw him down. And if you kind of wait at a safe room because he can't, can't get in there, he'll like, you can just see him walk around and search for you. It's so scary. Yeah. He's such a good enemy. It really feels like there is a living person like just wandering that police if he moved faster it would feel like pvp yeah <laughs> um it actually it actually makes me because I, I i he's just started fucking up my shit he actually makes me reluctant to go back to play the game because i don't want to feel that tension he's so scary and there's like it leads to so many emergent like kind of moments where like he walks through a door there's another zombie in front of a door that you want to get to you kind of freak out you throw like a grenade just like you should like it's just like oh, i'll try run by it's like it's so scary you're just watching him from a corner seeing him move and you're like okay he's left i can make that run now and it's just it, it's just it's playing with a boogeyman in the game mm. um is, is, is he procedurally generated then for like each kind of playthrough you get so like you might you might have a good experience or a bad experience with him um, he's triggered when you go to a certain part of the building okay. and I think for certain areas he's like a constant in that area like he is he is there until you complete that section and he has a physical space and he always does unless you run to like the complete opposite side okay he, he's also drawn by like your fire so if you start shooting a zombie he'll hear you oh I didn't know that yeah he will come so you're kind of like in your best interest to not shoot and try and get away um, which is a problem because the zombies themselves are a fucking problem like yep. they're they're really damage spongy and they had their grab range is insane like yeah. I, I actually have a lot of trouble weaving in and out of the zombies which I never really did in previous Resident Evils it's kind of like you kind of have to get them to go around a little bit from the table the other way, then yeah. run out another way, or like get them to try and do the grab, and when they've done their grab, run by. Like, there's a whole lot of stuff. And it's, ah, oh God, they're really, you can give the zombies themselves damage. Like, you can shoot off their hands so they can't grab you. you. Shoot off their fucking faces. <laughs> yeah, and their feet, and they will still crawl for you at all times. And I was like, okay, well, I'm just going to start chopping off feet all the time because that's the way I dispose them. No, it isn't mm -hmm. because they're still a pain in the ass on their feet and they're less visible because they're on the ground and yeah. they don't move until you come close to them. Little ankle biters. Yeah, little ankle biters. Um, Leon looks great. I played Claire as my first run through and she also looks... I think she looks fantastic. Like, she looks, looks like a great. person. Yeah. Um, I like the... I guess if I have one complaint and this is like a very small complaint because I really liked all of this. I... I wasn't too in love with some of the boss fights. So like G is the mutant you kind of fight for the boss fights. William Birkin. Yeah. yeah. 
the, there's a second one in particular and there's just a way to kill him you kind of use um you use a kind of crane thing to knock him off the area is really small it feels like you can only really do that one thing it's kind of an annoyance and kind of coming from mr x to kind of a really kind of annoying boss fight kind With of no thing. strategy the first yeah. fight against him i, I really liked like yeah. i thought it was really old school but in a way i thought it was very fun and like you know his damage model just fucking Mm -hmm. destroying him was really good the the boss fights with him do feel very old school yeah and I think there's like maybe four maybe five boss encounters with him I think the majority of them are good I think one of them's okay and I think the other one's like nah like fine like I would I would be fine to go through that game and not do that fight again I know how to do it now so it'd be really quick to get it over and done with but it kind of the tension of everything else just wasn't there for that one I was just like oh okay um, I have so many good things to say about it. How do you, how do you feel overall? Really like it. Really, really like it. I think they've done a lot of super smart stuff. I love the aiming in it. I think um, they've really balanced the kind of maneuverability of Resident Evil 4 with like the tension of having to keep your reticle on a zombie's head and wait for mm-hmm. it to kind of lower in so that you can't kind of just keep moving around. Like you have to plant yourself and shoot even though you now have the option to shoot around. Really, really good. Like couldn't Capcom have given this game everything they have. I could not add more polish to it. It just looks brilliant. Music's great. Although I keep hearing to play it with the old soundtrack. Apparently the old soundtrack still rules. Yeah, you, you like the old soundtrack. Um, I've had a bit of it with it on. It's fun, but I think the tension of the other one is genuinely scary. Because sure. it kind of rises and falls in areas where you think something might be there, but then it isn't. Yeah. Um. I kind of agree with most of the things you're saying. Like, I love the puzzle design. The puzzles are really fun and really satisfying. And the way the map works where, like, you know, it shows when you haven't found everything in a room, that is such a godsend for me because mm. I always have that issue with survival horror where, like, fuck, I know somewhere in this apartment complex I've missed something. I just have to go through it all again. I love having all that kind of laid out in front of me. Um... I guess for whatever reason, and I can't really put my finger on this, is I'm not rushing back to it. Mm. Like, I'm not, like, overjoyed to get back to it. And when I play it, I have a really good time, but I think it doesn't have a hold on me like it seems to a lot, a lot of people. And I'm not sure why that is, you know? Sometimes I feel like everything I'm seeing is exceptional, but maybe an exceptional version of something I've already seen. Mm. And that kind of maybe is taking away from it a bit. But I also feel like that is a super specific criticism that's kind of maybe unique to me. And I don't think a lot of people have that problem with it at all. It feels like an old game. Like it feels like a modern old game. It has Mm. a very classic sensibility to its puzzles and just how you kind of move through the world. And I think a lot of it is getting better and faster at it so you can replay it multiple times. Yeah. Um so i can see why it wouldn't feel like it was doing much new and then like i have a lot of nostalgia for the original um for the original resident evil 2 and there's some bits in from that that i feel like it maybe drops the ball a little bit uh there is a bit of a feeling for me and i love all the old resident evils where it's kind of like this isn't my leon kennedy and this isn't my claire redfield there's two bits in particular that stand out so far. The first is the liquor moment. Mm. Um, I get what they're doing. You know, they play with your expectations and the liquor moment doesn't happen where you think it's going to happen. That's totally fine. But I guess just that really amazing lead in of like the blood dripping on the ground and then, you know, it goes into the full FMV cutscene and Leon looks up and there's just, just what the fuck is that? Like, it's not mm-hmm. a zombie. You've never seen anything like this. It makes me really sad that moment isn't there. And then the second is very similar in the first William Birkin cutscene where you're just seeing this fucking monster just like destroy this SWAT team and you're like I don't ever have to fight that right it's it's a little disheartening to me that he just kind of shows up and those are two like cinematic things and maybe you know their purpose is they're trying to make it more gameplay focused but it does break my heart a little bit that we're kind of missing out on them and that they weren't maybe integrated in a kind of different way but then there was other stuff where, like, did you look at the concept art? Yes. I felt like that first section, walking through the flames towards Raccoon City, 
that is or towards Raccoon to Police Department, that is the closest I've ever felt to being in a piece of concept art. Fucking outstanding. So like, yeah, I have some grievances with it. I think this is an amazing game. Do you want to know my big grievance? Go for it. I didn't like when Claire met Leon at the fence and she was kind of weirdly flirty with him. That was a really weird scene. Because like there's zombies everywhere and they're like, hey buddy. Yeah, she's like, Leon! And like, it's just like, okay girl, like maybe not the time. But um, it just kind of felt weird to me and kind of felt like strangely out of character. I think that picks up a lot later on when you meet Sherry and Claire's like this badass protecting a kid and it's really like enjoyable. But it just kind of felt weird yeah, like that, they've that, met that, each other once. That cutscene stood out to me as super jarring. That was like yeah. a scene from a romantic comedy. Yeah, and there was something like off about it. I don't know. It seems like Capcom are steering the fan fiction. This is here's my fear of everyone like, in the what's Resident happening. Evil universe is like a Ken doll. There's no genitals. But that's what I, that's what I okay. I love that about Resident Evil. <laughs> really? It, it, this is gonna sound <laughs> weird, but like that Leon is smooth. When you there. were like like when these games came out in the like was this like early two thousands late nineties late nineties late nineties yeah. yeah. Resident Evil is one of the only game series that had kind of female protagonists for a long time. And they had female protagonists that weren't love interests. Maybe there was enough kind of subtextual things where you're like, are Chris and Jill a couple? What about Leon and Ada? What about like, Chris and Barry? What about Chris and Barry? That's a fucking beef mountain I'd like to climb. Like, yeah. there was like enough subtextual stuff that you could have a ball with it, but it was never definitive. Mm. So it was like, you know, guys and girls being friends and respecting each other at, by their capabilities and kind of stuff like that. And it was all just like friendship that kind of brought them together and sometimes like siblings like Claire and Chris and there was like a lot of room where it wasn't just we're going to pair them off kind of stuff so with that cutscene with Claire and Leon I was just like he's a boy she's a girl can I make it more obvious like it kind of felt like that like they were kind of pairing them off you just quoted skater boy I know I did (laughs) but like you know what I mean you know you're like I I never considered it from that because I'm because I've always been like why doesn't anyone bone in Resident Evil that's what I sound like. Um, <laughs> but you're totally right. I, I completely get the appeal of that. I always enjoyed the platonic relationships and I always liked that the girls were as cool as the guys in Resident Evil. Oh, I think in most... Like, I think Cooler. Leon's up there, but in most cases, like if you ask me fucking Jill or Chris, if you ask me fucking, like even from Zero, Rebecca or Tattoo Man, mm-hmm. quite tattooed tribal man, <laughs> like Rebecca was the best. Um, so I like that stuff and now there's like they're relaunching the film series and I'm like and they're like oh we're going to focus more on the characters from the games and I'm like oh no they're going to pair them off then there's the rumor of a TV series and I'm like oh no it's a Netflix no. TV series yeah. isn't it oh boy they're going to pair them off so it's kind of like the stuff I like about those wacky characters and nearly like they are just Ken dolls um, where platonic relationships are kind of more important than romantic relationships because they're in a zombie fucking apocalypse. Yeah, I, I, I do really, really like male-female platonic relationships and mm-hmm. stuff because you don't get a lot of it. You don't. Um, I'm afraid that that's going to start disappearing a little with this new age of Resident Evil, which I love. I love this game, but I'm kind of a little bit nervous of that aspect. Okay, big question everyone always asks at the end of these discussions. What is next for Resident Evil? Resident Evil 3? Resident Evil 8? Eight. 8, I'd say. I'd eight. say 8. I yeah. don't want another remake. Not I yet. want... Like, these mechanics, all this shit, it's fucking cool. I want to see them advanced, and I want to see a game built around these mechanics. Battle Royale zombie game. But, oh, fucking finally. God, no. I think, like, the last games in, like, 2018 and 2019 at the start, and I think Bioware are kicking themselves in the fucking butt now people are hungry for good narrative games and people are good for single um, hungry for single player experiences and they will sell yeah yeah i i don't think there's ever a time in gaming where a strong single player game like you know from a good studio a good ip will not sell like mm-hmm. it's it's baffling to me that somehow game studios all came together at the towards you know the end of last generation and we're just like no no they're done games is service yeah but um I think we can all say like hell of a strong year, a hell of a strong start to 2019. Like re- some really really cool shits come out. Certainly, certainly, guys. What say we move into our quick time events? All 
I'll take this first one. Uh, Metroid Prime 4 has been restarted after 18 months of development. Uh, this was a weird one, because Nintendo put out a YouTube video with the comments disabled, <laughs> and they just had... You know what? Probably a good move. <laughs> and they just had one of their own, uh, speaking Japanese, subtitled, uh, just going... Uh, Metroid Prime 4 is, is still in development. We announced it at E3 June 2017, year and a half ago. And development isn't going as smoothly as we hoped here in Japan. So we're going to give it back to Retro Studios in Texas, who did Metroid Prime 1, 2, and 3. And they're going to start from scratch. Yikes. <laughs> um, so... Metroid and Nintendo is a weird one. Nintendo haven't made a Metroid game since 2002, I think. Yeah, 2002. And all the other Metroid games have been, like, on loan to another second-party studio. So Retro Studios did the Prime Trilogy. Uh, a Spanish studio that did the Castlevania 3DS games did Metroid Samus Returns in 2017. This game you really liked, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's a good game. Uh, Metroid Other M is made by Ninja Theory, or no, no, sorry, not 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 Ninja Theory. The the ni ni Team Ninja. Ni Team Ninja. Yeah. Sorry, Ninja Theory is a completely different studio. Yeah. Team Ninja, and that game is a like Metroid's weird because like fifty percent of it is amazing, the other fifty percent is just shite, <laughs> just like a really really spotty series that is so cruel to their own fans. <laughs> and <laughs> but like it just kind of brings a bigger argument of like. Showing an animated trailer or logo or a cinematic that is purely an animated short and just being like, okay, hey, we're going to start development real soon. And just being like, it's completely misleading. Yeah, it, they did the same thing with Final Fantasy VII Remake. They like showed the trailer, they announced it was going, then they gave us the apology announcement of, well, we farmed out one of our biggest properties for some reason. For some reason, CyberConnect couldn't make a good game. Which is weird. Why the fuck would they ever give the... <laughs> anyway, it's like Final yeah, Fantasy we've been, VII. We've been down that road, yeah. and like I say that as a fan of CyberConnect, but what the fuck? Anyway, Metroid. It's yeah. just really like bad optics i think just to put up a title screen and just yeah just and hope it works out two yeah, years and later just be like yeah i guess that'll come it's just like if you don't even have a game started if you don't have anything you can look at why are you announcing it and i know it's just the hype because people they use the that title screen card came up at the end yeah and it, it, that, it, it, that it, title it, screen card seemed more to me like a Hail Mary for that press conference because there was nothing there. Yeah. And that was an E3 one, wasn't it? It was E3. There was, I, like, I remember us talking about that conference on this podcast and being like, besides that Metroid, there was like fucking nothing. Yeah. Um, but it just means that that game, earliest it'll come out is the end of 2020. Mm -hmm. Probably end of 2020, early 2021. And like the choice to delay it. Be good. Yeah, oh, yeah. absolutely. Make, make it right. Yeah. And like Retro do amazing work and they're working on another game for Nintendo. Yeah. We don't know what that is. I think it couldn't be another Donkey Kong. What if it is another Donkey Kong? Could be another Donkey Kong. Like, because like, like they like got like a retro... lot of mileage out of Tropical Freeze because yeah. they released it on the Wii U and Switch and I have yeah. to imagine it did pretty well. The Switch port was done by a different studio that they just gave them all the assets because right. Retro were too busy working on this other project. Right. But that project must be in a later phase of development if they're willing to accept this because retro aren't a big studio no they're not um how would you feel if it was another donkey kong game i'd be i'd be cool with that because after donkey kong country returns i was like oh why are they making tropical freeze and now after tropical freeze i'm like make more fucking donkey kong i want more dong i'd be happy with dong forever <laughs> yeah we want the dong here at the let's fight a boss video game podcast yeah um i i i, I just kind of prefer the approach like two games talked about with with the re2 remake they announced that at E3 2018 and said so it's out in six months time. Mm. They also had that We Do It thing. Yeah. Which was like the guy who kept campaigns to get Ori 2 done and then he showed up and he just held up a sign on Twitter once that just said, We do it. We do it. Uh, and then with Apex, you know, it's out. It's out and it's yeah. fucking huge all of a sudden. I, I just, I prefer that way to announce and approach a game development. Like, just keep it under wraps until you're 100% sure it's gonna get made it's a, it's a miracle Apex was kept under wraps yeah mm -hmm. like yeah. like I know I know it's super hard in this 
day and age, but you can NDA the shit out of something. Yeah, or at least like announce it a year before like it comes out. You know it's what I like, like? A good nine month yeah. mm-hmm. press cycle. That's before fun. it even goes into development, it's just ugh, it's crap. No, I, I I do think games should be out within the same year that they're announced. I I just it's not fair on anyone involved. Yeah, like to put to put that amount of pressure on someone developing the game for 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 fan expectation. I just like you need to. Be fucking cautious. You know a real good way to fuck up a YouTube video? Tell people you're gonna do it. <laughs> but that smoke. Yeah. It, it's just, it puts such a weird pressure on you and it never ever works out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Ubisoft. Ubisoft's Division 2 marketing email. Hey, what the oh fuck is God. this shit? So you know the way um, there's a government shutdown in the US. Nah, is it still going? It's over now. Think, but it was their longest in history. Yeah, and you know it was days. it was it caused a lot of problems. It cost a lot of people a lot of money. Like especially you know on the ground people, people working in the service industry around Washington, a lot of them were hit really hard people by this. People were rationing their food and stuff because they hadn't like they weren't paying them during the shutdown. Yeah, it was real bad news, and so Ubisoft sent out around a marketing email for the Division Two that read. Something to the effect of, <laughs> this is what a real government shutdown looks like. And this is amidst their fucking bullshit press cycle where they're like, hey guys, The Division 2 isn't political. We know it's about attacking the White House, but it's not political. I don't know if it's about attacking the White It's about attacking fucking government in Washington, I don't know, some bullshit. But it, it's like... Ubisoft has constantly been like trying to play with this political narrative while also backing off as much as it possibly can and it is it's really like just fucking do it or don't yeah it's so toothless and you can make a game that like if you're gonna make a game that is political like ideologies in it you have to say something yeah like it's like Far Cry 4 like people are like oh this will be interesting and then they're like they just fucking wet the bed with it. Woo! You can jump off cliffs and you broogie. Um, Aaron Signal made a really, really good video on Far Cry 4 and their issue with saying it wasn't political and how it, everything ends up being political. You always say something when you make a narrative. Yep. And it's just like, it's such like piss poor Ubisoft. We make games for everyone. Everyone, please. They don't want to alienate anyone ever, but they still will send out emails like this. And it's just like, you know what you're doing, you know? You just, they just want to have their cake and eat it too. Yeah, this this is real. I feel like Ubisoft, for a long while, were, were kind of, a lot of my problems with them were disappearing. And my problems were mainly just like, I feel a lot of their good sentiments were always lip service. And I feel like they were just concentrated on making the same fucking game with the same fucking exploitive mechanics that get people addicted. They just do everything, no matter the actual quality of the gameplay. And this, with the Assassin's Creed shit and with this, it's like a return to that toothless Ubisoft that I really don't like. Mm-hmm. And it's really disappointing to see. Jiren and Videl coming to Dragon Ball Fighters. I saw this. That's cool. This is cool. I'm very, very excited about Videl. Jiren's a big, strong. Fine. Whatever. Yeah. Videl, I'm really, really excited about. Have some issues. What are your issues? They made her, like... A little cuter in fighters than she is in real life she's already plenty fucking cute you don't need to do that okay secondly mr saiyan man spoilers gohan does all her special moves he yeah. jumps oh. into the fight and does and i think that sucks that's kind of lame yeah the only other mortal is yamcha and he's able to hold his ground yamcha krill and tien yeah, yeah, I guess. Yeah, but like, if those guys are able to, because like people are like, well, you know, you can't have Videl fighting Frieza. If fucking Yamcha can fight Kid Boo, if Yamcha can fight fucking Purple Cat God Beerus, Beerus, then Videl can fight whoever. Like, the it's 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 a really like, I I I'd be cool with Mister Sandman maybe coming along and like for a super or something. You know, that's really fun. But I I I don't know. I just. If I want to play as Videl, I want to play as Videl. I don't want to play as the third version of Gohan in this fucking game. Um, and so, yeah, super nitpicky, but I was disappointed in that because I think Videl is easily one of the coolest characters in all of Dragon Ball Z. And I think it's just... Just 
just let her be her. Like, you have an entire fight with Swapovich where she does a bunch of crazy shit. Let those be her moves, you know? Or make up some new moves for her. I like her filler stuff in the anime where Gohan goes to high school. And, like, there's way more of her just being like, who the fuck is this guy? Yeah. And him, like, uh, stopping that bank robbery. But then she enters the Majin... The Majin... The tournament arc, yeah. Yeah. She's yeah. great. Um... All Systems Goku were talking about how, like, their theory is that, like, she's been watching Mr. Satan fake being tough his entire life, and to, like, be able to compete with how tough she thinks her dad is, she actually got that tough. And I think that's a really fun read on that character. But I'm still really happy she's in the game. It's just... Yeah. But, you know what? I'll take it. Like, I love Videl. I'm still hoping for Bulma and a Mac. Oh, man. You and me both, buddy. Yeah. And then our final news story <laughs> <laughs> was Apex Legends, not Titanfall 3. I guess we've covered that. Yeah. A bit. It's just that they were developing a game that ended up being not necessarily compromised, but like pivoted mm-hmm. to a popular franchise or, or a, a popular game mode yeah. these days. Uh, maybe Respawn were making a very, very different game at the start of this. Yeah. Mm hmm. Um, I sure do love the campaign mode in Titanfall 2. The multiplayer in Titanfall 2 is really, really fucking broken. Still fun to play, but like, kind of waiting around for like the good parts of a match and not the bad parts of a match. Right. What are the good parts? What are the bad parts? When you're in the Titan. Okay. <laughs> when you're not in the Titan, you're waiting for your fucking Titan to load. Right. Because otherwise you're just wall jumping and making sure nobody fucking hits you in the back of the head. Right. Because that's how you fucking play Titanfall 2. <laughs> I play a lot of Titanfall 2. Yeah, you, you got into that in a way that I did not expect you but to. But then, like, the campaign of Titanfall 2 is, like, comparable, like, in my opinion, to Half-Life 2. Like, it's just so fucking good. Yeah, I still have it sitting on my PlayStation. And it just, it. It, it'll pick up and drop mechanics. It, it Like, it doesn't rely on anything as a crutch. Yeah. It's just, like, we've got so many ideas, and here you are. Do you think if Apex does well, do you think that makes it more or less likely we'll get a Titanfall 3? Mm, I think they could end up um, supporting this forever if it did well. Yeah. You know? It'd, yeah. Be, it'd be cool if they could just split off a division now and let them do Titanfall 3 or do something completely, you know, well, like, like, like it's cool they made a new IP. I mean, Epic were meant to be working on an, another shooter, Unreal, Yeah. before... Fortnite, they even had this live stream where they entered the first line of code, man. And then Fortnite blew up. So they, they have to like prioritize talked, that. And they never talked about Unreal again. Yeah. They have their Jedi game, uh, Fallen Order, coming out. Oh, yeah. This year. Which what? we have seen nothing of. That's Respawn as well. That was that. That was that kind of weird announcement where they went yeah. into the audience. It's like, oh, don't worry. We're talking about something. Wink. Steve, stop winking at the camera. <laughs> Something might be coming. It might be a Jedi game. It might be called Fallen Order. Neve's winking a lot. <laughs> you know how Visceral were making the Amy Hennig Star Wars game that got canned? Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. they wanted to make them get them full-time on the multiplayer stuff. Mm. But now key people from Visceral have left and started their own studio. Huh. With, the, uh, with, 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 with the sole intention of making a single-player campaign game. That's really cool. Best to look to them. Yeah. Um, I, I like online multiplayer games, but I, I go with a single player experience any day. Same. And with that, let's move into some emails. All right. All right. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll do the first one. This first one is from Lorcan. Uh, I have a particular love for a handful of games that I could only import to Ireland in the 90s. Chrono Trigger, Mario RPG, uh, Earthbound amongst them. Hell yeah, that's that's three strong <laughs> games. These games were pretty difficult to get a hold of back in the day. I'm always delighted when I meet someone who has played them. So I guess that's you, John. Uh-huh. Uh, what experiences do you guys have with importing games? Importing games. I've 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 got a few. Um, I guess the big one for me was I didn't import it myself, 
but I was in a speciality store called Mr. Calculator and I saw that they had, I think my dad like rang around over town because he could tell I was a small child with a problem and he got me, he found a place that had the original Pokemon red and blue before they ever came out like over here. And so I had like Pokemon blue like a couple of months early and I was the coolest fucking kid. Sweet. I got Pokemon Silver six months early. Yeah. I got it in London in the Trocadero Center in October 2000 for 50 pounds, which is a shit ton of money. That would, yeah. Even like, you know, even still now for a fucking Game Boy game and I got Pokemon Silver. Didn't come out in Europe until um, spring 2001s. You know the best part about it? fucking your friends finally get it and you destroy them yeah because they don't understand how leveling up works yet uh, we both got Animal Crossing imported we did I got the Australian Why? version did you get the Australian version because Animal Crossing was fucking cool yeah Animal Crossing is the shit Neve. Uh, yeah but enough to import it just you to get it talk, early you should talk to Michelle yeah. <laughs> um, I remember seeing gameplay of Animal Crossing on a DVD that came with a Nintendo unofficial magazine. Man, I used to love that shit. You'd get mm-hmm. like a PlayStation disc and there'd be like 12 trailers for the weirdest garbage yeah. you've ever seen. So there was one for Animal Crossing and I was like, what the fuck is this? And so then I found out uh, CD Wow, which was an import CD website, also did... Oh, I remember, yeah. Also did import DVDs and games. And so I was like, I bet they have Animal Crossing. And they had the Australian version, which is PAL region, same as Europe. So I imported the Australian version two years before it came out here. Do you know, I, I, one thing I could consider doing in my old age is just collecting demo discs and watching the trailers and pretending I've never played oh, them. Oh, eBay has a scene. Yeah, I'll, <laughs> bet, I'll fucking bet. But um, another one I actually remembered was, um, I might have told this story on the podcast before, but me and my friend who lived across the road, me, David, were huge into Smash Brothers, played Melee, like, non-stop all the time. And, um... He was like a good bit younger than me at this point. I think it was like four years between us or something. But I imported Smash Brawl. And, you know, at the time, like, you know, Brawl isn't that well regarded now. But at the time, you know, it was the sequel to fucking Melee. It was like the biggest thing in the world. And so I imported Brawl. And a freeloader disc. Yeah, and a freeloader disc. That you need to activate every time yeah. in advance. And I told him to come over. And I set up the stage on one of the classic stages. So it looked like Melee. And I, I I picked his character and I picked my character, so it was just on a pause screen before that. So he couldn't, no way for him to tell that it was the new Smash Brothers. And so I unpaused the game, and he puts his hands on the controller and moves like an inch and just starts screaming, "Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god!" And that was that was one of the best memories I have in gaming. It was really fun. Such weenies. Such weenies. Neo, have you ever imported a game? No, I used to buy all my games on sale on Eason's. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean that's else. cool too. There was nowhere else to get them in, awfully. Uh, no, I've only ever imported DVDs and Blu-rays and never games. I have a good story about importing DVDs. Mm-hmm. Um, I wanted to import... <laughs> I know this story. Yu Yu Hakusho, The Dark Tournament Saga. You know, one of my favorite anime arcs of all time. Couldn't find all the episodes on the internet. Just new scattered bits and pieces that happens. It was going to be for my birthday. I was really excited. Birthday rolls around. Yu Hakusho Dark Tournament Saga doesn't arrive. But a package arrives. Big square package. Dressed John Walsh. I open it up. I get Marvin Gaye's 50 Years of Genius. Or something. 20 Years of Genius. Amazon sent me the wrong DVD set. Wow, that's did, such a mix-up. And did, did you put it on? No, I was like, I don't want to play this. And my mom was like, mm, my Marvin Gaye is pretty good, John. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I, I, I think now as like an adult with like a sustainable cash flow, most of my, I'd say over half of my games are Japanese. Like I own so many Japanese like Game Boy games and mm. DS games and a bunch of Japanese PlayStation 4 games. And you just buy them online now? Yeah. Sorry, it wasn't Marvin Gaye, it was Ray Charles. Ah. Ray yeah. Charles. Yeah, the jazz musician. He was apparently very good. He is. The last time I had to jump through hoops to import stuff was getting into Takarazuka because it's extremely hard to buy 
DVDs and Blu-rays online. Um, Japanese DVDs work in our are the same region, but Blu-rays aren't. Uh, so I had to contact a buyer, just this girl who goes to Takarazuka shows and buys the stuff. And like, she has like, it's on a text-based website. And you have to get her email address and be like, can you try and get this one? And she'd be like, okay, I need to go outside and see if I can find this. Like in real time, like she just goes to a shop and see if it's there. And then like, we'll tell you what they're selling it for. We'll put in her fee. Just like really nice community kind of stuff in the way that she's kind of like, I want people to like Takarazuka. So she sent me a whole pile of posters as well. But that was kind of the last thing I really had to kind of work really, really hard at to get. I miss that. I, I honestly really, mm. really do. I miss the days when, like, um, you would have, like, I still remember the days when you had to work really hard to get, like, a piece of Pokemon merchandise and, like, every new illustration. Like, this is the original 150. You know, you mm-hmm. had no way of knowing what the other Pokemon were. And, like, you'd see, like, a fucking concept sketch of, like, a Hitmonlee and you'd be like, what the fuck is that? And it was just, it was... So- Man, those were simpler times. Remember importing all of Evangelion, like the box set from Australia, but their DVDs wouldn't work on our players. So I had to change over my home computer's Oh, I did DVD. that so many times. But you only have like four changes. Yeah, my yeah, dad got pissed. Yeah. So it's just like, it was a gamble, man. Yeah. I need to do it. You could, you could reset it if you reinstall Windows. I see. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, shit, there's only one Dad, left. it's doing it again. Everything's <laughs> just gone. <laughs> Um, uh, we're probably giving away how old we are, but yeah, we're very old. Mm-hmm. I went on the internet on the Sega fucking Dreamcast, everybody. We used LimeWare. Oh, yeah. Good times, man. It's a torn bleach on LimeWare. Oh, those are the fucking days. Just download, like, an AMV on LimeWare. What AMV? Doesn't fucking matter. Mm-hmm. Just something to watch. Just something to watch 20 times. Do you guys remember Real Movie Player? Yeah, oh, I do. Yeah. <laughs> Or DivX. DivX files. DivX, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Holy shit. I, I remember we bought a DVD player and it was DivX compatible. So that meant we could burn movies onto a, a DVD minus or a DVD plus or and play it. And it was like you watching a movie on your television. A girl once gave me a CD of Bleach. That doesn't even make sense anymore. I used to do that. I used to burn DivX of Bleach and give it to people. This was, ma- like, this was manga. Like- Oh, whoa. Yeah. Wow. Okay. But there's like 700 megabytes in a CDR. That's fucking nothing now. I know. It was like three episodes per disc. There was a lot. My first memory stick was uh, 200 megabytes. My dad was like, no, this was really expensive, Ryan. Mm-hmm. So you hang on to this for college. Oh, better times. <laughs> I, I don't yeah. know. I bought a 64 gigabyte USB stick for a tenner there. It's... Now is the better time. No. I think I liked it better when I was gated off from all this shit. When I had to work for it. I think I was a better person. Ignorance is bliss. Ignorance is fucking bliss. Brian, what else we got? Uh, we got a cute one here from uh, a fan who we've met in person. I'm not going to say her name. This is a very cute email, so I just wanted to read it out. Uh, so I'll get to the question. Uh, I have this idea of using origami uh, for a guy that she really likes. He likes origami. Uh, to ask him out, and I'm just wondering, is this a stupid idea? Uh, to explain it further, I made him a, a shuriken, and one of the flaps has, will you go out with me on the inside? Oh, it's so cute. I don't think it's stupid. No, I don't think it's stupid. I think you should... I think asking someone out is a difficult thing, and whatever makes it easier, you should go for it. Yeah. Yeah, like, I don't know. If that's meant to be, he'll really appreciate that if he likes origami, and that's cute. And also you can be like, I can make you other things out of origami. Yeah. yeah. And, if and says, a little hat. And if he says no, you got a dangerous fucking weapon right there to teach him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, go for it. Mm-hmm. Best of luck. Best I, of luck. I, 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 I really hope it works out. Okay. Let us know if he says yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah please do. Please do. <laughs> Sometimes people ask for advice on stuff and I, I'd love to know what happens. I'd, yeah, l- like, I'd love a follow-up yeah. on it. And, and, and I, I, I like follow-ups. If you've ever taken our advice, whether it was directed at you or just like, I don't know, no, you just found something helpful and it went well or not well <laughs> <laughs> we'd love to know, know if we yeah. ruined your life did you guys yeah. ever ask anyone out in like a creative way no no me neither I don't think I've ever asked anyone I out. bet it's really flattering yeah I bet 
Um, I mean, I've tried to woo people in creative ways. Oh yeah? How'd you woo someone, Eve? <laughs> I drew Rebecca an entire birthday party. <laughs> I remember that birthday party. <laughs> you were there. Uh, why? Well, I keep thinking, I and like, and like, I, like it was good because you, like you, I you made, were just a pawn in I this game. Of, I needed people for the facade of party. I made a bunch of friends at that party, and it was good. But I remember arriving, and it was a birthday party, and I was like, Neve, why? Like, why am I here? Happy birthday! I don't Some know. Weird fucking pawn in your weird game, Neve. Yep. Just a prop. <laughs> Um, just just to reiterate, our email is ask let's fight a boss at ask g- let's fight a boss at gmail.com. You too can receive this incredible response. Ask us a question, and if it works out, email us a follow up. You know, I always say we get a lot of questions. Try and get through as many as we can, but usually it's two hours into this podcast. We're tired. Mm-hmm. Okay, we've got enough for two more. Okay, cool. Okay, this is from KK. Uh, do you want me to read out, or do you have it? I have it. I can read it out. Okay. Oh, shit. I don't have it on the wire. I've got it here. I want to give you a break, though. Okay. Thank you. Um, we're, we're all either about to get a cold or getting over cold. Oh, yeah. So we all sound kind of stuffy this episode. Uh-huh. I'm on the verge. Uh, John gave us his cold. I didn't have a cold. I had a flu. And you would know if you had it. He was um, just licking glasses and giving us drinks. That's not what happens. <laughs> Brian's head cold is different to my flu. We talked about it before you arrived. Because you were late, Neve. <laughs> yeah, Neve. Uh, hi, Elfeb Queens and John. Your recent discussion about Red Dead 2 and how the ending portions of the game was much better than the start of the game made me think about when it's appropriate to drop a game or TV show that you don't enjoy. I want to ask you guys how willing you... Uh, how willing you guys are to give a game or TV series that you don't necessarily enjoy another chance before dropping it entirely. Best regards, KK. That's 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 an interesting one. That is, because like, and Red Dead kind of made me reconsider this a little bit because I was really not having a good time with that game and I was so sure I was going to drop it. And I'm so glad I didn't. But I also don't think I would have been wrong to drop it. Uh, like for me it's kind of a gut feeling whim where like let's say you're playing a game or watching a TV series and it's been like two weeks since you've like put it on Mm -hmm. and you have free time and you're like maybe I should go back to that and it's that feeling of I really really don't want to put that on right now yeah or or or, or you're just like fuck it I'll give it one more chance and it's that one more chance that usually makes it makes it or breaks it sometimes like when I'm not enjoying something I'll drop it but I have this like nagging feeling in the back of my head that I'm missing something and sometimes that feeling can last a really long time and when that happens I'm usually like ah I should give this another shot if I buy a narrative game I try my best to finish it at every time, even if I don't really like it, because I like stories, so I'm going to get something out of it, you know what I mean? So I like kind of... want a conclusion to it. Yeah, because I feel like if I've played 60 hours of something and I'm not going to do those other 20, or I've played 40 hours and I'm not going to do another 10, I'm kind of like, <clears throat> did I even even play it? You know, I feel like I need, really? yeah, I need to put it in the finished box wow. before I feel comfortable with it or something. So like, you know, um, I feel like God of War, for example, peaked with me at the start and then I kind of felt its narrative went downhill, but I was like, I want to finish it out because I've gotten so far with it kind of thing. Um, so I don't usually drop narrative games ever. TV's different. I feel like I can tell from the first two episodes if I want to watch that or not. I can know straight away just by the writing or how it's shot kind of thing. Yeah. There's no mystery that's going to really, like no great end episode isn't go- is going to turn me around on something I think looks like ass. That's how I feel about games though. Mm, yeah. I don't like I feel like I don't know why I I enjoy the act of playing games a lot so but w- sure. when I'm wa- watching something I kind of I find it harder to watch things cuz I feel like I'm not doing something. See, I guess what I get haunted by is when I'm playing something that doesn't fully have my attention, could I be playing something that would? Mm. You know, like, I don't want to come on this podcast and explain how I think a game is okay. I want to come in and be like, oh, this fucking thing's awesome, you know? I think how I manage that is I usually have one game I'm chipping away at. And then I have, like, two smaller games. I I play around four games at the one time. So I'm kind of jump between them. And I'm like, today's a Red Dead day. Today's a Resident Evil day. Today's, like, a a shooter day, you know? Yeah, Yeah, I don't like to play one game. I I like to have Mm -hmm. at least 
one other game, but usually I'll have maybe two or even three. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I find if you're with a group of friends and someone is playing something that you that 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 you've dropped, but they're still enjoying it. For me, that's enough to be like, well, look, that game is getting its praise from someone else. Maybe not me, but I'm fine to leave it at that. And sometimes I might ask, you know, a couple months later, can you can you can you tell me the ending of that game? I think I'm nearly the opposite. Where like, if some a friend is enjoying a game I've dropped, I'll be like, oh, did I miss something? Because a couple of times, Brian, I think you've told me about games that I, like I have kind of dropped, and what you tell me about them has got me interested again. That's 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 happened to me once or twice yeah. as well. It, it kind of just depends on the game. Like for me, if it's a TV series, if it's something. Or like a TV or movie that like nobody else I know has seen yet. I'll usually try and finish it to the end just to see. Because you'll never know otherwise. Yeah. Um. But that's kind of it. Yeah. Have you ever had a friend who loved something so you wanted to love it and you just could not get into it? Because like uh, we have a mutual friend, Steph. She's really good at Dishonored. I tried to play Dishonored thinking I would love it. Did not like it at all. Watch Steph play it like a master, like so impressively good that I was like, I want to try this. I think I could love it like Steph did. Nothing, absolutely nothing. Did not like that game at all. Just, just couldn't. And I was like, I wish I could get there, but I just couldn't. Steph's face has gone red now. I know, I'm so sorry, Steph. Hey, Steph. Hey, Steph. Um, I don't think I've ever wanted to like a game because someone else liked it. I've had the thing where like, I want to like a game because I see the kind of reaction it gets out of people and then have that not happen for me, all right? Mm. But never, I guess, an individual mm. person. What about you, Brian? I'm, I'm kind of the same. Like, it's cool seeing reactions to stuff, but, like, maybe that's that's it. Like, you're, you're not going to get it for yourself because you kind of, you're, you're, you're kind of expecting it then or yeah. you know what's around the corner now and... I don't know, like you're sort of spoiled for it, but then like maybe you weren't going to get that reaction anyway. Yeah. It's just, it's just doesn't suit your personality. It's just how it is. Mm. So I, I kind of drive myself insane though, thinking about like, well, what if I had had, had had zero expectation going into this game? Like would I, would I be more blown away then, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like with Wargroove, that's a game I've been following for two years in development. Yeah. And I'm so fucking hyped for that game. And then when it comes out and I, my expectation is so high. But I and think, it's just I think delivering that's, that's kind of different yeah. to like if that game had gotten like loads of 10 out of 10s and you played it in three months because Wargroove could still be shit. You know what I mean? Could still be shit. Could shit the bed in the last act. And it totally. But, well, no, I mean like it coming out to its release, it could be bad. You've never played it. You've just seen trailers and stuff, you know? Yeah. But it's different when people are telling you it's really good. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But um, yeah. Interesting question. Drop it whenever you feel like you want to. That's That would be my advice. If yeah. you feel like a game is wasting your time, don't waste your time. Yeah, time is so precious. Time mm -hmm. is so precious. Okay, uh, we got one last uh, email. Uh, I'll read it out. Is that okay? Yeah, go for okay, it. Okay, this is from Mary. It says, hello, gay, cute, and sad. Yep. Uh, I hope everything is going well. I wanted to ask what you all thought about consuming bad media. I had a whole discussion with my girlfriend about how a bad movie Godzilla 2014 was, and yet when I saw it, I thought it was a really fun movie. To be fair, I saw it in theaters, I haven't seen many Godzilla movies, but I enjoyed the sound design, the build up, the monster design overall. Are there any pieces of media, games, books, movies, etc., that you like even though they're supposedly bad? So many. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like all my favorite stuff is bad stuff. <laughs> or like. Stuff you like in the moment, and then a year later you're like, that was shit. No, I always still yeah, love everything. I love, love, if I, like, if I love it, I love it. If I like thing. something, it's so rare, I'll mm -hmm. go back on it. Because, like, I love The Force Awakens, but I totally get all the criticisms that gets. But you still like it. Like, you don't think it's any worse, do you? No, I think it's fucking brilliant. Yeah. I'm saying with the new, the most recent Avengers movie, or the one that came out last year. Infinity War. Infinity War. I really, really like that. But, like... Yeah, no, there, there's some glaring problems with that, but I just think, like, in the moment, you like it, and so you just always have that good memory of it, and it's always it's always going to be good in your looking back at it. Uh, like, 
I feel like over the years I have really stopped caring a lot about the like what what I like and what is good or bad like to me it's kind of just that look that's my taste I like what I like and mm. I don't care like I think Street Fighter 2 the movie is one of the greatest movies ever made the, the live action one I fucking love that movie it makes me so goddamn happy whenever I watch it and like like is it an amazing piece of cinema I don't care it <laughs> makes me happy when I watch it why would I qualify that you know yeah um, all the Resident <laughs> Evil movies I, there, I had such a good time watching. I know them, they're so great. Yeah. That, like, I they're my f- favorite film franchise for a lot of reasons because they're fucking silly as hell, and I love making other people watch them because they're like, "This is terrible." I'm having such a great time, and you're like, "Yeah, yeah." And like, if fucking Roger Ebert was like, "Those are actually bad movies," I'd be like, "Whatever." Like, I don't care. Yeah, I, I like 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 Venom last year is a very problematic. I had a great time with Venom. <laughs> yeah, it's good film. I can't wait to watch that again in like seven years. Yeah. Um there's stuff in like the Robocop movies. Like I think the Robocop movies are some of the greatest things ever made. They're great. <laughs> but Robocop 2 is really fucking stupid. I really love mid two thousands films like um like Daybreakers. Um the vampire one with Ethan Hawke in it. I think. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, the Underworld series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's so yeah. many Underworld. There was a special blend of action yeah. films. Oh, but then. Like, but then like the push and the jumper films, stuff mm. like that, where it's oh, just yeah. like like sexy people in sci-fi trench coats. Yep. Uh, Romeo Must Die, Queen of the Dam, Dracula 2000, The Matrix Reloaded, Ma- baby. Matrix Reloaded. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like those films make me so happy. They're so fun. And like I don't get it. Like I. I like, I get the idea that this film is really beautifully crafted. Like, you know, this exceptional director came along and he composed the whole film with these very precise camera shots and the narrative moves forward and, like, the characters all have these meaningful things to say about modern society. All that shit's great, too. Like, it is great, fantastic, whatever. But if a film's a good time, that's just as important to me, you mm-hmm. know? Like, the most important thing to me with media is how I feel when I'm watching it. That's all I care about. And if I have a blast watching something, I'm not going to revise that opinion later on. Like, I might watch it again in a couple of years and be like, I don't like it as much as I did then, but I'll still have a lot of reverence for how I felt about it then. Yeah, like like that fucking Angelina Jolie assassin movie with James Wanted. McAvoy. Wanted. Good shit. So, like, Wanted is so good, I'd never need to see that movie again nope. because inside my mind, it, it, there is no problem. Magic there's Loom. Not, there's nothing wrong with it. <laughs> Not for grandma. Yeah. <laughs> when me and Brian saw once in the cinema, uh, grandma walked out and Brian just leans over and goes, Not for grandma. <laughs> it's, it's too fucking cool for When it. I saw Broly, uh, mother and daughter walked out about 20 minutes in, but then they came back and I was really happy because I was like, Oh, I bet she's like a little Dragon Ball fan. I thought that was cool. Fuck yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, there's loads of fucking good movies I like. But if you're going to watch those every day, that's so depressing. Yeah. And just a lot. Like, yeah. I'm not going to watch Annihilation every day. <laughs> no, like, like, okay, I love Moonlight. That's a beautiful, amazing film. Everyone should go see it. But I'd rather watch Idle Hands. I, that's, like, an awful thing to say. <laughs> but is it, like, an, applying this, like, kind of arbitrary standard to it, I just, I don't see the point. Mm-hmm. Like, lo- love what you love. Like, you know, if something makes you happy... Why would you take that away from yourself? There's just some people who are really like... Like, I was talking to a guy before, and I was like, oh, I, w- I was re-watching Fast and the Furious with my girlfriend. And he was just like, oh yeah, but they're bad movies. And I was just like, by whose standard? And but I feel like, like that's him saying, okay, we can talk about this, but aren't me and you too cool for these yeah. movies? And like, that's the only reason that exists. We kind of had to have like a... Like, a, like, we had to have this agreement at the start of the conversation that they were we both agreed they were both bad the movies were bad and i was kind of like i don't know if i want to do this anymore and i was just like by whose standard and he was like well they're not going to win an oscar oh and i'm and like that's, oh. that's that's the point that these conversations get insane to me when it's mm-hmm. like this group of old people in la won't say this film's good and that's what you think makes a good movie yeah like like oh man the oscars are used to push films like it's like it's by their peers like there's certain movies that get picked for oscars and to kind of rate everything by that standard is so fucking boring yeah and And let me tell you as someone who watched the first fast and the furious movie in the last six months 
That movie's a fucking banger. So good. I love that the thing they're stealing is like TV DVD combo. Fuck yeah. <laughs> it's timeless. Enjoy what you enjoy, everybody. Don't don't qualify it. Just have a good time. Star Wars prequels are the best ones. Okay, well. <laughs> They're, they're getting she's, some she's love. She spoke her truth, you know? Yeah, yeah. She's, she's sticking, she's dying on that hill. <laughs> um, I want to give a little shout out to a dude who met at a, a, dude who met at a con recently. Yeah. Connor? I Connor. Think was his name. And Connor was cool enough to give us three dedicated sci fi books, one per person, personally, I guess, tailored to our tastes. Yes. And just want to say shout out because, you know, that was a really cool little gift and we appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so um, much. I am early on in Roadside Picnic. And this is a book I've really wanted to leave read for a long time. But even like being early on, I think it was written in like 1977. It's crazy how much other fiction has curbed from this book. It's fucking cool. I'll, I'll probably say more about it when I'm, when I'm done, but I'm really enjoying it. I got a scanner darkly, but I haven't started yet. I've seen the film, the Richard Linklater film. How about you, Niamh? What'd you get? I got Ursula K. Le Guin's... I think it's The Left Hand of Darkness? I can't mm. remember. Yeah, I, I, I think that's the one. Um, I've read some Ursula K. Le Guin, the Earthsea series. Um, and I'm really looking forward to reading more of this. And hopefully we'll talk about them on another podcast. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe we'll do a sci-fi book club special. Who knows? Mm-hmm. Finally. Guys, what's we, what say we do some Patreon shoutouts? This is from number one familiar of zero fan. Man, I love my virtual friends are always there to keep me company so I don't have to play Fortnite alone at two in the morning. Thanks, Elf Ab crew. <laughs> no problem, buddy. What's what's it called when you win in Fortnite? I think it's called a, a big a big combo. Good luck with those big combos. <laughs> Brian. I just did one. <laughs> Sorry, Neve. <laughs> this is from Zinkai Jordan. My favorite podcast is Allow Us to Battle a Large Foe, starring Josh, Brain, and Gnome. <laughs> yep, totally. And this last one is from Crimson underscore Helm. Just so you know, Hunter... Just so you know, Hunter x Hunter, he's wrote it that way, is pr- is pronounced x because the hunters... What? The Did hunters you? are silent. So he's saying... Yeah, I get it. He's saying it's pronounced Hunter Hunter. Crimson Helm... A fucking you think you're the first fucking person to ever say that to me you think you come on this podcast and look why did he put the x in why did he put the x in he says it's silent well guess what the makers of gif pronounce it's jif i'll be cold in the fucking ground before i ever say that x why hasn't give it to anyone you. like consider the fact that it's a shipping title and it's hunter x hunter because you know you meant to ship the characters you're meant to ship them it's like we're the only people who understand that goddamn show oh crimson helm you got me all spiked now this part of the podcast is meant to be like a minute long and you know you're supposed yeah, to yeah well whose fault is that Crimson Helm whose yeah. fault is that thank you so much for contributing to our Patreon yeah thank and you and if you would like to contribute to our Patreon you can head over to Patreon forward, patreon.com forward slash LFAB Brian what's that patreon.com forward slash LFAB guys let's say we close things out with a little loot drop okay I'm going to drop a little video by one of our longtime faves, Aaron Signal, and this is Irony, Vaporwave, and False Realities. This starts off as a review of a really weird ass kind of first person game. I don't know how else to describe it, but it kind of turns into this really cool discussion of like Vaporwave, and then he talks about like the Dead Mall series, and it's just really super interesting. Aaron Signal is a really talented writer, and his videos just have this lovely, chilled out vibe to them, and he's a really cool guy, so check him out. Um, I'm going to drop an Aaron Signal video as well. Oh um, Far Cry 5 and the artist saying nothing, just since we were talking about Ubisoft and their ability to say nothing. And uh, my second one is Philosophy Tube has a new video on Steve Bannon, and it was really, really good. Probably one of his best ones today. Philosophy Tube's really cool guy. Brian, hit us with this heavy load. <laughs> I don't like the word load. Well, then you shouldn't pick three. <laughs> I have, I have three loot drops. The first it's one, officially a heavy load when we have more than one loot drop. This okay. A, this, this is a big fat one for you guys. <laughs> Get ready to drop it on your store, doorstep. Uh, first, I've got the Kirby reanimated in case 
you're the one person who hasn't seen this fucking video. Uh, a bunch of cool dudes reanimated an episode of Kirby, but it's the episode of Kirby where they open up their own animation studio, which I thought was the perfect choice. And you just see a wide variety of animation talents, each owning their five seconds. Yeah, and like the level of good animation in this, it's really cool. And just the Easter eggs and jokes, yeah, and it's... just the the nods they have to twenty five years of Kirby history. It's good stuff. Uh, I love the Kirby anime. Right back at you. I think this is this is some good shit. Yeah. Uh, next one is Pat Mac on YouTube. I look back at Bandai Kirby's adventure plushes. So this is a YouTuber who does YouTube videos on video game plushes. Particularly uh, like merchandise from Sonic the Hedgehog and merchandise from Kirby. And I know me and Kirby plushes have a, a big story on this podcast. People keep going on to me about like how I don't have a big Kirby plush because I left it in Japan. I already have... Yeah, no, you're a mistaken viewer. I, I already have a big Kirby plush. I have nine Kirby plushes. I, I don't need any more right now. I will get another one, but not now. I need to, like, appreciate the ones I have. Yeah, they need to get to know each other and climatize and stuff. Yeah, and so this is just an interesting one because it just talks about some of the original Kirby plushes. And one of them in this video is a friend of ours, Rahana, when she was in Japan a couple of years ago, she went to an abandoned city in southern Japan that I think it had, like, a nuclear fallout crisis, like, alert thing. And they had to just abandon the city, but now you can go back there and explore the city. And she found that exact same Kirby plush and took a photo of it and sent it to me. It's worth two hundred dollars on eBay. Wow! Oh, sorry, sorry, two thousand dollars. Someone took it from there. Well, like it, it was left there. She took there. a photo, didn't she? she yeah, she just. So took she a... could have took it though. It irradiated. Uh, no, yeah. like, like it looked fine, but I was like, "Would you have brought that back?" And she was like, "It looked way too wet." Yeah. So like someone it, took the radiated Kirby plush to sell on eBay. No. No, we don't know if someone took it. That's where our knowledge on what happened okay. that plush this is. This isn't the same plushie. Oh. It's just this oh. particular release. Yeah. Okay. That's I thought there was like a radiated <laughs> Kirby plushie. plushie he started anyway. moving around. But that's like, why it's so expensive. But like there is, there is there is this whole cursed object thing with the Kirby plushies. There's a famous picture now of an old original Kirby but he's holding a knife at, and he's at someone's door. Um, it, 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 it runs deep. Okay. <laughs> and the last loot drop is Be Kind Rewind on YouTube, comparing every version of A Star is Born. Uh, this is a YouTube channel I got recommended. Uh, it's a girl who just talks about uh, Oscar winners, particularly Best Actress Oscar winners, but she's kind of branching out from there. And I saw A Star is Born, the new one with Bradley Cooper and Lady Gaga, and it's a, it's, it's, it's a nice film. Um, What's interesting about it is that this is this is the fourth time this film has been made, and it's just her comparing each different version and each version of Hollywood that that it, that it was made for, and how they're all very very different films, but they all kind of follow the same formula. I highly recommend her channel. It's a really 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 interesting one to watch. Cool. Because with that, we close out today's episode. I feel like I feel like we made it. You know. Yeah. Yeah, this is um this is my seventh run of this timeline at the moment. Ah, oh, who died? What did you do? I keep getting hit by buses. I think I'm just a normal. I think I'm a nobody. I don't think I'll remember any of this. Awesome. That's yeah. what. I, that's kind of what I've always wanted. This is the best podcast we've done. So this is your seventh run, Brian. How many times have you murdered me and Eve? Twice. Okay. Uh, once on the podcast, but this is so far like, <laughs> but like, but like, so far this is like the chillest version of episode ninety three that I've done. Okay. Cool. Uh, not for you guys. There's been camera ones for you, like the one where I killed Neve first. Yeah. You look so serene, John. <laughs> oh my! Can you just imagine if Neve just like wasn't a thing, and we could <sighs> stop it? <laughs> I'm just getting getting weird. Neve, if Brian murdered you, that would. That would bum my evening right out. I would haunt you specifically. That's a, oh my god! That's I so wouldn't un- even haunt Brian. I would haunt I'd totally you. Totally haunt John oh, as well. I'd, oh, I'd hate that. I couldn't do any weird shit or anything. John's super haunted anyway. He's got a big fucking magnet that just says "Spook me real good, baby." The only thing you could do if you were haunted was try and gross out your own ghost. 
Like if I was haunting you and you were just like, well, Neve, we're going to the toilet for seven hours. <laughs> I'd be like, no. Well, Brian, it's time you see what I do on those long walks by myself. <laughs> you know the ones. I know the ones. Can we, can we talk? No, not those ones. It's, I don't know. Can we talk? We don't do that. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. I apologize for everything that's happened. You can cut all this out if you want. No, yeah. this is the sleepy time. We're all very tired. We're all tucking you into bed. Oh, no, Nick, g- you always get so weird with this. Cut it, cut it, that's the end. <laughs> We're all sick as well. Brian has coughed gently onto your face. Oh, my God. <laughs> hit, the con- hit the button, Brian. That's enough. Bye. you for your money it's not because i think you're funny these dollar bills they keep me coming i like the way you say you love me but i only want you for your money